All right. Welcome, everybody. It's been a little bit, I believe, over a month since we last had one of these. So uh, good to see everybody again. Happy Sunday. Um, just been a bit tied up here with a few things living in uh, California. So trying to take advantage of that. And uh, I think one of the big themes over the last few months anyway has been that uh, we are really we've gone from a short cycle you know, couple of year investment to now looking at uh, multi-year investments. So with that, just less activity um, overall in the markets, uh, less things happening to share. And we've we've gone through a lot of sessions already. So uh, trying to now have these big, hopefully more impactful uh, sessions that, that can cover a lot of detail all at once. Um, everybody knows I love these uh, super long and detailed sessions. So coming back to this, uh, but they do take a little bit longer to make as well, so it's going to be less, uh, less of a uh, uh, less sessions per month, I should say, uh, moving forward. And I think that's that's really uh, going to be the mo. Um, just given the topics are a little bit more interesting, and uh, I'll say it again, a little bit more detailed. So uh, before we begin, obviously a few things up front. Uh, nothing I say today is investment advice, so please. Uh, talk to a registered financial advisor if you're looking for more information. Everything I say today is my own opinion and understanding of the topic um, at hand. Uh, today is especially uh, prevalent because some of the deals that I will talk about today uh, are are deals that I really have no interest in. So they they were by companies that uh, are either private or they're companies that are outside my investment interest or mandate. So I've been kind of learning a lot too about those deals as I as I made this uh, seminar. So um, the seminar and the slides. So definitely some stuff in here which is going to be new, uh, both for myself and uh, I. I hope for the viewers as well. And also, please uh, check your own risk tolerance. So um, this is a very volatile sector to begin with. We're seeing a lot of changes in the uh, commodity price. We're seeing a lot of new changes in the way the overall markets are acting, uh, whether it is with the uh, uh, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, or the interest rates, or just momentum-based trading uh, happening more and more. So uh, for sure, uh, check your risk tolerance when you're investing in this, uh, in this sector, and please check your portfolio construction so uh, for those that are following my portfolio on the website, which I'll talk about here um, shortly, there has been a few changes, but but that portfolio is based on a specific strategy uh, that may or may not fit your investment uh, mandate and uh, portfolio. So uh, please check that as well. I do have a mailing list. So uh, the mailing list strictly send out the Zoom links and any files that go with that. Um, so if you do want to be on that list, please shoot me a DM or an email and we can get you on there. I, I do have an update on that. As of uh, August 1st, I will be putting out my first newsletter. Uh, it, there's no subscriptions or anything. It's it's all free. Uh, the newsletter will talk about the changes in the main companies that I now cover. So as I go from covering 50, 55, 60 companies on the surface to now covering uh, the White Tundra portfolio companies more in detail, so we'll talk about the latest well results. We'll talk about the latest enhanced oil recovery projects, uh, any new licenses, where the drilling rigs are, uh, such and such. So that will be a monthly, uh, I call it a newsletter, but it's really, it's really an update, a way to update the, the smaller companies which don't get as much airtime. Uh, some of them don't put out as many news releases. So uh, it's a way that I've been getting lots of questions about what's going on uh, in these small companies. So I want to come out and really just put everything in one uh, little format. And uh, to begin with, I think I'm going to send that out to the mailing list and then also post it on my Twitter. Uh, if if it becomes that too many people on the mailing list, we're only looking for the, uh, uh, the Zoom links and the files and I get some feedback on that, then I'll just keep posting it on Twitter. I don't really want to create separate uh, lists or anything like that. So we'll keep things as uh, straightforward as possible. A uh, little portfolio update. I've got a few messages about this as well. So yes, Meg Energy was sold. Uh, it was sold primarily to fund the uh, Pre-Provident uh, equity uh, offering. 
So we participated in that uh, in a significant manner, along with some of the uh, connections as well. So in order to get into that, a equity uh, in the portfolio had to be sold, given that I am not interested anymore in really going heavy on margin. Uh, plus, some of the junior companies can't be bought on margin anyway. So uh, something had to be sold. And the relative on a relative basis, uh, the company that made the most sense to do that was, was Meg Energy. Uh, trading at a very, very nice uh, uh, premium, I should say, to some of the junior companies. Of course, on a eight times free cash flow model, still screens very cheap. And based on the reserve life, still screens uh, very, very cheap. But uh, a decision that was made there and uh, the money was allocated right away. It was not It was not a uh, way to just exit a position. It was basically switched over um, into the next one. Um, another couple of things, the Zoom is recorded. It will be on YouTube right after the presentation. Uh, and then the Twitter space also, yes, should be recorded. So that will be on there um, as well. And then uh, I've got a couple other updates here. So as I kind of mentioned to begin the presentation, the uh, schedule over the summer will be very unfortunately spontaneous. So <clears throat> things do come up in the weekends that are three, four, five days before uh, something will come up that I would like to attend. So I've been moving the schedule around. I, I do uh, understand the frustration it can create for people uh, who have uh, put this in this uh, in their calendar, looking at the um, forward looking schedule of the presentation. So definitely going to try and update as soon as possible uh, if I do get something like that. But um, the next few for sure, uh, I will just say it outright, are are definitely subject to change. Um, so I will I will definitely keep try and do that as soon as possible as opposed to keep it um, to the last minute. And uh, that's kind of it for the updates. Uh, quick little reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, and you can join us. Uh, if not, the Twitter space will run with uh, audio only. So uh, today's session, a 2020 to 2023 MA review. So there's been lots of transactions in the last three years. Uh, people will be maybe a little bit surprised that a lot of transactions actually happened in 2020 and 2021. The last 18 months or so has been relatively quiet. There, there really hasn't been as much activity uh, as there was. Part of it is just valuation differences. Part of it is the fact that there's less companies to begin with. And part of it is there's less companies in distress. A lot of them paid off their balance sheets in 2022. So in pretty good shape, they don't need the uh, transactions or anything like that. They're just happy making cash flow, buying back shares. They don't, not really in any hurry to sell um, either. So um, yeah, and the... When I first started making this, this presentation, I was going through each deal and trying to calculate how much of the, uh, the purchase price has been paid back and stopped doing that because I found it was just taking too much time to try and run that kind of uh, modeling and wasn't really all that interesting because a lot of deals were X amount paid back, but what does it really mean for the asset moving forward? What's really going on? Did the company drill on it? There are so many different factors. Uh, I was becoming more of a, a, a calculation for cur a curiosity as opposed to a calculation that actually meant something. So today's presentation will really be a high level review of around 60, I wanna say 50 or 60 different transactions. We'll just go through the assets, talk about things that are interesting in that asset, uh, different kinds of technologies that the new company is using, uh, we'll talk about some of the multiples and purchase prices, but really it's not meant to be a in-depth presentation on the geology uh, or, or, or the uh, overall structure of every single deal. It's more of a high level understanding just to see how deals have evolved, what the purchase prices uh, have evolved to, and just which assets got transacted and uh, people can follow those assets as the cycle continues. We're still very, very early. Uh, one of the trends I noticed was some of the assets that were purchased, very little activity on those assets. So some of the companies are still waiting for much higher pricing, uh, possibly $85, $90 uh, plus, and then they can go and implement a aggressive drilling program. They can go and implement a uh, some sort of enhanced oil recovery uh, moving forward. So yeah, with that, we'll get started. Um, of course, any deal that I discussed today 
there's a lot more information on uh, on it uh, on on the website uh, of some of these these uh, companies. The corporate presentations will give you some more detailed maps and uh, and then um, softwares like Petro Ninja, of course, you can go well by well by well and uh, look at each single thing. But uh, if I was to do that today, uh, we would be here till Tuesday or Wednesday morning. So it's uh, still going to be a pretty in-depth presentation. So we'll get started here. So before we get to 2020 to 2023, we'll go down memory lane for a second. So 2013 to 14, this was when oil price was above $100 a barrel for about two, three years in a row. Things were getting heated up. The uh, energy scarcity mantra was running supreme. Uh, we had assets that were getting older. There was companies that were wanting to grow, new companies coming into Canada and a lot of um, competition for these assets. So this is what happens after we stay in a cycle for about a year or two. So it, it does take a little bit of time. It's not that oil prices are gonna ramp and all of a sudden the, all, all the m and is gonna re-rate to these uh, excessive premiums. It could happen in certain climates, but in this climate, uh, it's gonna be more of a, we'll, we'll believe it when we see it sort of thing. So we're gonna want stable cash flows for multiple years, and then the M&A heats up. But uh, just to give you some examples here, so the Viking was a really, really hot play. Same with the Williston Basin in uh, North Dakota, the Bakken was a very hot play at the time because you could increase production. These wells had really, really good payback rates and they were cookie cutter. You bought one section, you could drill 12, 15, 18 wells uh, on that section, and you came out with, with pretty decent results. Uh, obviously high decline in both cases, but you could still increase production and you had the inventory uh, to do so. So here we go. We have White Cap Resources made a $110 million deal uh, in 2013, April, uh, over $120,000 a flowing barrel. Um, White Cap also bought Invicta in the Viking, $60 million deal, $120,000 a flowing barrel. Now, these also came with lands associated with it. So it's not a strictly... Uh, a flowing barrel deal, but you can see that some of these junior companies with land, with inventory, uh, what they were getting bought out for. Legacy Oil and Gas bought Villanova, uh, $110 million in the Williston Basin, $61,000 a flowing barrel. And then the big deal, Bonterra Energy bought a cardium asset uh, from Spartan Oil, $480 million, uh, $107,000 a flowing barrel. So um, definitely uh, a lot going on here the transactions were at much higher prices and these assets that were being bought are your frac technology assets, which have a hard decline on it. So um, maybe a little bit different than some of the assets we'll discuss here as the presentation continues, which are your low decline, stable base production uh, for many, many years to come. Uh, on top of that, we see uh, two, 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 so, one of these transactions here, we'll, we'll look at this uh, Invicta, a white cap and Invicta asset. So they're buying, they're buying assets for $60 million here. And the cash flow of that asset was about $9 million at the time. So seven times cash flow. The free cash flow of that asset at the time was $4 million with a slight bit of growth on it. So um, free cash flow, maybe we can say to keep production flat, the free cash flow was five or $6 million they paid 10 times free cash flow. So not just on a per flowing barrel multiple, but when you compare it to a cash flow multiple uh, or FCF multiple, we were seeing the kinds of uh, multiples that uh, we're basing our modeling on the eight times free cash flow model was being uh, even overdone with, with certain companies paying, even with the 2014 growth baked in, uh, Whitecap paid about nine times free cash flow on this deal. So. One example doesn't represent the entire industry, but these kinds of deals were going on. Um, and again, it takes a couple of years for anybody saying these multiples are not going to return. How do we know? We need a couple of years of higher sustained pricing, and then we can make a judgment uh, as to what is and what isn't going to happen. A um, few other ones, same kinds of things. Uh, Crescent Point buying Lightstream resources out in the Williston Basin. 114,000 uh, per flowing barrel. That was 3,300 BOEs per day. Um, some other deals here being made. 
uh, as well. You can kind of see the metrics, Whitecap buying another Viking asset in 2014. So really consolidating that asset at the time and not scared to pay over 100,000 a flowing barrel on three, three separate deals now um, that we see here. We also see um, some deals that Surge is making here. Oops, let's go back. Um, some deals that Surge Energy made at the time. So they bought uh, this Shonovan asset, uh, $240 million, 67,000 a flowing barrel. Uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, this asset is currently on the market for sale. So we have come full circle in exactly 10 years um, here, but you kind of see what's uh, what happened in the past. And now we'll get started. So going to go back from 2020, just six months, we will begin with CNRL uh, and Devon. May 2019, a major deal that occurred. Um, probably a catalyst for this was the Alberta uh, pro um, production caps that were created by the NDP government in late 2018, early 2019, uh, in response to very, very low uh, WCS prices, a huge differential because of egress problems. And Devin just wanted out. They were looking to sell assets and CNRL swooped in 128,000 uh, 300 barrels per day, all oil and about $4 billion. So uh, very cheap, 35,000 a flowing barrel for something with a long life uh, reserve, something with their uh, infrastructure in place, the money already spent and 1.5 million acres uh, of land came with this. So additional uh, oil sands and conventional opportunities um, there. The uh, based on the productive capacity reserve life of 16 years. Uh, they say productive capacity because at this time, this asset was uh, producing below productive life, again, because of the aforementioned uh, production caps um, that were created. And something that I found very interesting, the CNRL's debt was 24 billion when they made this deal and their debt to cash flow ratio, 2.15. So, when I hear these days that uh, companies are running high debt and they're leveraged and they are risky companies, I just don't believe any of it because even as early, we don't even have to go back 10 years. We can just go back to 2019 and companies were very happily running uh, 1.5 to 2.5 times debt to cash flow. And that used to be the metric that they used to uh, strive towards. So now that companies are running 0.2 and 0.3 debt to cash flow, um, I just cannot agree with any argument that says that they're highly leveraged or that they need to really pay back more debt um, other than certain small to mid caps, obviously, which are running slightly higher ratings, but still not two times debt to cash flow. Um, okay, there's a question here. Is there any way to determine or, or characterize the collateral inventory uh, that came with those flowing barrels? So yeah, this would be, I think an easier exercise done if we just look through PetroNinja. So I can look at, let's say white cap. I can look at the land that came with the three Viking transactions that they made. And then I can look at how many wells white cap has drilled on those uh, over the last 10 years. And that's gonna give us a pretty good idea of how many locations came with it at the time. Um, just given that a lot of the Viking at this point has been drilled. Um, yes, is there still good undrilled inventory out there? Sure. Uh, but a lot of the land that came with those, those transactions can be found out that way. Um, maybe somebody can find corporate presentations from 2013. The uh, web archive is actually pretty good at that um, and kind of do, do that sort of research. But uh, I think for, from my perspective, it'd just be easier to look at how many wells were drilled on those lands uh, and how much oil was produced from those lands um, we could actually run a curve that that shows us the production from that exact asset over the last 10 years uh, to give us an idea. Even we could even calculate the cash flow that came out of those. Um, and again, I wanted to do that for some of these transactions, but it was just taking way too long, um, especially for for companies that I would never invest in uh, at this point anyway. Um, so here is some of the land that came uh, with it. The yellow is your CNRL land. The green is the Devon land. And then there's some land that actually was already 50-50 uh, between CNRL and Devon. Nice synergistic acquisition. Uh, I believe the, the CNRL management had commented when this acquisition was made that it was one of the most, uh, uh, the acquisition that made the most sense because of how close the assets were. 
a couple of uh, oil sands facilities, the Jackfish, uh, and then some of the uh, CNRLs, Kirby North and Kirby South, which are still active right now uh, and producing a lot of oil. I believe something that they're putting a lot of money into here uh, in the last little bit. Uh, also a bunch of conventional oil that came with this. Conventional heavy oil, very, very nice because A, it's low decline and B, you have a lot of long life uh, reserve associated with it. So when prices do rise, the netbacks on heavy oil go up uh, almost exponentially. And so you can go in and, and ramp up production on these assets when the price is right. So uh, they bought these in 2019, waiting for the price, a um, little bit of activity, but uh, not, not too much here. Again, you can see how synergistic this acquisition was. It just makes so much sense. The Devon asset is surrounded by CNRL. So, and you can see some of the wells as well. Uh, some of them are going into each other's acreages, which tells you the pool was also contiguous uh, into the different asset bases. So very, very nice acquisition. And uh, one one little comment here, they bought the asset for 3.775 billion. But when we look at transactions, always look at the effective date. So if the effective date was two, three, four months in the past on something making 130,000 barrels per day, you're effectively making or saving about $100 million a month, just rough math on that sort of asset. So by the time it closes, let's say three months down the road, the actual closing price may only be 3.3 billion or 3.4 billion. So something that's very important to keep in mind when your companies are making acquisitions uh, with straight cash, look at what the effective date is, run some numbers on when is it gonna close and what will the actual effective payment be uh, at that point in time. So that was Devin CNRL. We got Kona and Pen Growth. Um, Pen Growth, of course, a, a uh, previous darling of the uh, Calgary oil patch. Uh, for those that remember, the uh, Scotiabank Saddle Dome, the hockey arena in Calgary, was the Pen Growth Saddle Dome for almost a decade, uh, maybe even longer. So a lot of people were familiar with the name uh, just because of that reason. And this was a $740 million transaction. Mostly debt was taken on by Kona. Kona, of course, now Strathcona, run by the Waters Energy uh, Fund, which has itself grown to uh, over 150-ish thousand barrels per day. Uh, we'll talk about that here as we go on. Uh, but essentially, this, this company got absolutely clobbered. Look at the share price chart. 2007, trading at $20 uh, per share. And even in 2017, was trading at 50, uh, 50, 60, 70 cents over a dollar at some point uh, per share and was e uh, eventually bought out for five cents in late 2019 as heavy oil just would not recover. And this company got burdened in, uh, under the debt load uh, as well as there was a big shareholder, a big shareholder here, uh, uh, Seymour Shulik, who owned about 29% of the company and just gave up. So he bought a lot of his shares, 50 cents, more than a dollar, more than $2, $3 in some cases, um, and lost hundreds of millions of dollars on this transaction. Maybe he made it back through some other way here. Uh, don't really know. All we know is the main details. Uh, that's what happened. And he had been going all in in 2017. And this statement will sound very familiar uh, on a bet that oil and gas prices would rise. So in 2017, fall of 2017, these multi-multi-millionaires were taking 29% uh, stake in heavy oil companies, betting that oil and gas prices would rise. So uh, the reason I mentioned that is uh, it just goes to show you the uh, pain and the longevity that the drawdown uh, has had since 2014. So every year, well, 2015, there was a a thinking that oil prices would come back. 2016 was when things really completely cratered. And then 2017, 2018, uh, people who were tracking shale were, were just looking. We didn't have the same kinds of data back then that we do now. So, so there was this belief that, okay, how much can shale really grow? How much can shale really grow? And it just kept growing. And in the meantime, um, these individuals who were betting on higher oil prices lost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. The companies lost hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, debt holders got completely wiped out. So there's a lot of pain. And, and when we say that there's PTSD 
in the Calgary investment community, why don't they just want to come back and 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 buy shares right away? This is why. The drawdown just, just went on for two to three years too long. And now people are in a little ball huddled and they're going to want to see uh, multiple quarters or multiple years uh, of higher oil prices. Uh, that's why, again, in my opinion, that's what presents the opportunity. But again, this is not investment advice. Uh, that's just the way that um, that uh, I see things. So third quarter of 2019, when they got bought out, they had 17,600 barrels in, from their Lindbergh uh, uh, steam oil facility, and then 4,000 BOEs from the uh, Montney in Crown Birch, which is right next to Crew and uh, CNRL's assets up there. Um, two, 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 so, yep. So the reason heavy oil, again, is preferred the many reasons I mentioned before, but also low operating expenses. So operating expenses uh, under $15 a barrel Canadian, very nice net backs, even throughout 2016, 2017. So looking pretty good. Uh, but look at the debt load that Pen Growth carried. So even though they were making money at 50, 55, $45 WTI, the, they were carrying uh, uh, almost three times senior debt to EBITDA. And look at the way they've described this in their in their corporate presentation. They're saying not to worry because we are just under the bank and note holder covenant limits. That's the way these companies used to represent their debt. Okay, we're under our covenants, just barely under the covenants, so we should be fine. Compare that and contrast that to what we see today, where we're talking about how how soon are we getting to net cash? Is the is the way. Uh, debt is represented on some of these corporate presentations. So I keep stressing this point because I think it's a very important point. The the definition of risk in an oil uh, in an oil and gas company has really changed, not just materially, but it, it's just completely changed. The definition of a risky oil and gas company does not mean anywhere close to what it used to mean uh, five, six, seven years ago, and even three years ago. Um, okay, and one other chart in here that's quite interesting is the uh, processing timeline. So when we see higher oil prices, the thesis is it's going to take multiple years for the investment community to, to respond, put that money in. And then by the time that barrel actually comes out of the ground, and you can clearly see it here. So the first regulatory, appro uh, regulatory approval was taken in Q1 of 2011 by Penn Growth. Uh, the first oil was not created till at least one year later, and the full ramp up took three years uh, to finally ramp up. Uh, the pilot, I should say, the pilot took three years to ramp up. And then by the time the first facility, 12,500 barrels per day, was at its full capacity, it took five years for that to happen. And this was a relatively small project that can get funded relatively easily in a $100 plus environment. When we talk about SAG-D or oil sands projects, you can see how this timeline just gets extended more and more and more. And even after the first phase came online, uh, by the time the second phase came online, it was another two years after the fact. So from Q1 of 2011 to Q4 of 2017 is what it took for those uh, 30,000 barrels per day. And a side note on this, again, the pain suffered by these investors. So you invest in a project in 2011, oil price is looking really good. The pilot comes on in 2013, looking good. The oil price is looking good. You go and raise more money. You go and, go and put more money into these companies. Uh, your first oil really starts coming online in Q3, Q4 of 2015. And well, bam, oil prices are down 40 to $60 a barrel from where you thought they would be. But you already spent all the money. And now you have got the regulatory approvals and, and you're doing construction of your phase two already. What do you do? You just keep going, hoping for better pricing, and the better pricing never came. And this huge multi-billion dollar company gets bought out for effectively pennies on the dollar and all these investor time and optimism and money down the drain. So definitely, uh, yeah, definitely a lot of pain um, for, for, for some of these pen growth shareholders. Uh, I don't think I ever owned this company, but one that I followed very closely uh, as a proxy for a high debt company and uh, how they were trading at the time. 
here's the Lindbergh uh, facility. So uh, near the town of Elk Point, which uh, interestingly enough, when I worked for CNRL, uh, I my wells were just south of this town of Elk Point, um, had 30 or 40 wells making 1,000 barrels per day. So very, very nice country, awesome oil, never really declines. Um, I shouldn't say never declines, very, very low decline rate. Um, and we can see some history on the asset as well. So Pengrove bought the ground birch uh, in 2011, I believe this was. Um, they, they ended up buying 18% of this company, Monterey, which they held for about five years. And then at the end of it, they decided uh, we're going to buy uh, the, the rest of the 82% of the company. They paid $366 million just for that 82%. So 366 million paid just for ground birch. And then you've got another 20,000, uh, 17 to 20,000 uh, barrel per day uh, SAG D facility and Co uh, Kona got it for just 740 million. You can see why investors were not happy at all over, uh, over those 10 years. Um, at the same time, the uh, Lindbergh asset has done relatively good. Production is, is declining slightly with uh, Strathcona having a lot of assets to put money towards the steam oil ratio is also going up. So for the first time hitting the four uh, steam oil ratio in February of this year, definitely want to track uh, going forward as, as to how this asset does as it gets just a little bit older. It's, it's, it's definitely still ver very young for a oil sands asset, uh, heavy oil asset, I should say. Uh, but we, we do see a little bit of a productivity uh, going down and the steam oil ratio rising pretty materially in the last uh, three to four years. So uh, one to track. And I found this pretty interesting. This is a Peters and Co conference um, itinerary from 2017. So September, 2017. And uh, we see pen growth down here at the end of day one. And, you know, some of these companies are still around white cap advantage, Birchcliff, Cardinal, but then you see other, other slots of companies that just don't exist anymore. So modern Jupiter and black spur, all gone. Uh, we can see here Torp Oil and Gas, Spartan Energy, Raging River, all gone. So um, we we really have consolidated the industry a lot already from 2017 to where we sit today. So any MA going forward is 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 really going to be uh, based on inventory requirements or just looking for bigger scale. Uh, some of the very, very small juniors and the 15, 20, 30,000 barrel per day companies no longer exist. A lot of these were in that range. These these Torque and Spartans, uh, Raging River, Storm, Modern, Black Spur, uh, et cetera. And, and some of those actually will be discussed here because they were uh, bought out in the last three years. Uh, IPCO and Granite. So this was a transaction in uh, late 2019, I believe, or early 2020. And uh, $59 million US, 77 million Canadian, uh, 1,500 barrels per day. Nice little clean asset and uh, an enhanced oil recovery scheme. So gas injection here, you'll find this to be a, a common norm over the last uh, three years or so. Some of the assets that were bought were where the junior company spent a lot of money on enhanced oil recovery. They spent a lot of money on delineation infrastructure. And then in 2020 or 2019, they got smashed and they just had to sell. They, they could not even take advantage of the production increase or their enhanced oil recovery project, making the money that it was supposed to. A um, couple of comments here. So high CO2 content of the gas, 24% naturally. This is something to track in enhanced oil recovery because CO2 uh, will enter the oil, make it uh, lower viscosity and allow it to flow much, much, much easier. So some of the oil in the world, especially in Canada and the US, benefits from a natural CO2 content in the solution gas or in the gas in the reservoir. So very, very suitable for uh, EOR projects when you have this kind of uh, um, CO2 content already in there and no evidence of a gas cap uh, was observed. So when you have no evidence of a gas cap, that means the reservoir is most likely under pressured. You don't have that, that flow, the pressure flow to push the oil uh, up Therefore, also very good for gas injection, enhanced oil recovery. Just simple things that can be figured out by just looking at the reservoir. Look at how much oil is being produced, how much gas is being produced, and some of the things 
um, that can be figured out. And it says even the Bakken is under pressured in this area. At this depth, it should be at 1750 PSI. Uh, I don't entirely know what the actual pressure is, but when when a pool is under pressured and it's light oil, that, that opens it up to a lot of uh, enhanced oil recovery possibilities, which uh, Granite had uh, has done here. And IPCO then bought it out. As you can see, very clean asset. Uh, still a lot of new drills here uh, to do on the southwestern side and a relatively new pool. So it was discovered in 2011 and then a extension was, was discovered in 2012 and then another extension was discovered in 2014. So again, these pools are very, very nice for companies to buy um, because they have the longevity. They have not a huge amount of production already being produced. Uh, they have the possibility to grow production and they have a lot of inventory to keep that production going for many years in uh, uh, this is in contrast to some of the older pools that are now at 20, 25, 30% recovery factors. And we're now going in and trying to increase production. Still a great business, still a great opportunity, but you got to realize you're starting on something which already has been produced. And secondly, the way that the field has been produced may not be the best way. So if a older field is littered with vertical wells, uh, if if they they haven't been water flooded properly, uh, maybe there's some sort of uh, thief zone in there that uh, has been missed, any sort of issues, and you restrict your overall recovery factor that you can get. Again, doesn't mean it's bad business, doesn't mean that the field doesn't make money, but starting off with a fresh field obviously gives you certain benefits um, that older fields just can't because they were produced with the way that was best at the time that they were produced. So a little bit closer, you can see the uh, field in more detail. You can see a 100% owned gas plant was built, a 100% owned oil battery was built, 8,000 barrels per day capacity, 20,000 barrels per day storage. So Granite spent all this money building this out and never got the uh, never got the recovery that they really wanted. And it's very cool to go back and read some of the news releases because these companies obviously had the potential. If oil prices were just a little bit higher, even $65, $70, $75 a barrel, they would have got a lot of benefit out of their discoveries and delineation. But at $55, $45 a barrel, these things just, they can't generate enough cash flow to get out of their own debt uh, and, and really grow production the way it needs to grow. So uh, we see some of the older news releases. They talk about uh, these, these well tests were 800 barrels per day plus and a bunch of reservoir gas to go with it. So really nice uh, wells and relatively small, like only 61 fracture stages, only 10 tons of prop in per stage. As we've gone on here, the fracks are getting more aggressive. The wells are getting longer. So definitely some synergies uh, from that as well. And we can see the um, basically just paying off debt. At this point, these companies, all their funds from operations was going to pay off debt. And they were just stuck in this debt burden uh, because they needed to spend the money to build a battery and a gas plant that's big enough for the field. But then they overspent because now they don't have the money to drill the wells to fill the gas plant or the battery. Now they're just paying off debt. It just becomes a circular loop which is very difficult to get out of uh, at the lower prices. And one of the things here was IPC actually paid a 61% premium to the share price. So at this point in time, um, they paid a huge premium, but overall, since so much of the money uh, of, the, of the value of the company was in debt, even paying a 61% premium was few seven, eight, $10 million extra, not really all that meaningful because of the asset quality that they were able to get. And something that uh, could become maybe not the norm, but if companies do want inventory, they do want smaller assets, they want to go and buy some of these, um, you might see more and more premiums being required just because the assets left out there are not that many and nobody's going to want to sell at uh, three times cash flow if they're not in, in any sort of debt duress. And always when I look at these kinds of projects, it's good to compare them to other fields. Remember, we have 100 years of oil production history. Uh, in North America, we have 50, 60, 70 years of enhanced oil recovery 
production history in North America. It's always, uh, it's not easy, but you will always find a pool that is relatively similar to the pool that you're trying to produce. This is the benefit of having very, very good production data, having a system in place to collect this data and a lot of field studies and uh, papers being written on some of these. So exact similar field uh, in Alaska, gas injection from the top, you push the gas down and you produce from the lower parts of, of your reservoir, um, very common. And the overall recovery factor here was 53%. Now that was over 40 years, so four decades, but still the recovery factor was 53% on just gas injection. So if we now compare it to what uh, IPCO bought from granite and we know the original oil in place, we can say, okay, over this many years, we will produce maybe not 53%, but we'll give it 40%, 35%. And one of the things that the reserves life and the reserve calculations just miss every single time, they will only give you credit for the next five, seven, 10, 12 years on a water flood, on a gas injection flood. But you can run the same pool, look at uh, analogous pools there, and you can say, okay, if this much oil is going to be produced, then the actual recovery factor on this is this, meaning we, we have this much reserve in the ground. And people will not give you value for it. Agreed. People, if they discount something at 10%, you may not get the right kind of reserve valuation. Agreed. But as an investor in these companies, if you're trying to figure out, does my company need more inventory? Or is the reserve calculation just not accurately depicting the enhanced oil recovery potential of this? That's an easy way to go and, and do, do these sorts of uh, tests. Very important for enhanced oil recovery uh, companies. So we're talking Cardinal, Surge, Gear, mo most of the heavy oil companies, even something like a Whitecap Weyburn and some of the Joffrey CO2 floods they're doing. You can go and and run these calculations. And then and, and in almost every single case, the reserves will have been undercounted um, despite a lot of narrative that reserves are usually overcounted, which is quite hard to believe. Um, but maybe for certain companies they are, for enhanced oil recovery companies, uh, I would argue that they're almost always undercounted unless something goes seriously wrong with your flood uh, at a certain point in time. And here is the production from these wells. So we can see that they bought it in early 2020, production about 1,500 barrels per day, didn't do anything with it until Q1 of 2022. So I mentioned this earlier in the presentation that some of these assets that were bought were just kept. They bought them, they let them decline, then they wait for higher prices, and then they ramp up very excessively. Part of the reason why a lot of supply came online in 2022 because you do have certain fields like this that were just waiting for the opportunity to go in there and spend capital. So in 2022, uh, looks like about mid Q2, the production was down to about 950 barrels from the 1400, 1500 on acquisition. And in a case of just six months, the production went up to 2700. So three X production. And I will make this point once again, uh, this is why doing any sort of rear view analysis and saying companies have not performed on their assets, uh, X, Y, Z, completely wrong analysis. So wait for the higher prices and then watch the geology shine. This only applies to companies that have the kind of geology and the assets that can be ramped up. And then they have the inventory life to sustain that for many, many years. Um, so there, th there are companies like that out there other companies just have a declining asset. So for those, the rear view analysis is the same as the forward looking analysis. Nothing really changes. Um, okay, so on to the next one, we got I3 and Toscana. This was a deal made in the very, very early stages of COVID uh, when the oil price first collapsed. Um, yeah, so I3 came in, a North Sea player, they came in, they bought this Toscana Energy which itself had bought some uh, wells from Ferenz just two or three weeks before that. Um, pretty pretty heavy oil, 13 to 23 uh, API, uh, very active area. Um, 
they they got some clear water lands with it but the clear water lands they got were gas depleted so as you can see in this map the previous operator drilled and they just produced the gas out of it which made the oil even more viscous it reduced the pressure that the oil had to flow up and so created a a sort of a depleted zone but with still clear water potential uh, they had about 46 sections in this area and as we know with heavy oil clear water like oil you can have 20 to 40 to 60 million barrels of oil per section in place. So you multiply that by 46, not every section will have the same amount of oil or recovery, but you can see why uh, these pools are very, very good to own as a company and recovery factors of 5% they're saying for primary and 15% uh, underwater and polymer flooding, we don't know quite yet. So Tamarack and Spur and Headwater are still very early in the clear water uh, pilots on the enhanced oil recovery and a few wells here being drilled by I3 um, along with some uh, uh, position here in the core, the Martin Hills, Nipissey area uh, as well. And very curious debt purchase. So Toscana carried uh, about $30 million of debt. I3 bought it for $4 million. So they went in, they talked to the debt provider and they said, look, we're not, we're not looking to pay you this. Uh, if we don't buy the company, Toscana is going under. You're going to be stuck with all these assets. In March of 2020, almost no buyer at that point. Nobody was willing to bet uh, on, oil, uh, on oil prices. At least that's the way that I would have said things if I was I3. Um, the debt holder may not have been an oil and gas specialist. And they were able to buy the debt for 15% uh, or less of its market value or of its book value. Excellent. Absolutely great deal making. And uh, you got to give kudos to them for doing this. Uh, whereas other companies, most of the deals they've made, they've just taken on the debt as is. Uh, this was true even in 2020 when they possibly could have negotiated the debt down. Uh, again, I've never made these deals, so I can't say for sure. Uh, but we do have an example here, a, a, an absolutely egregious example uh, where the debt was bought back at, at 15, 12 to 15% uh, of its book value. And they got uh, these couple of fields here. Um, they also got the Carmen Gay field in Southern Alberta, which is uh, has been discussed before because of its unique looking uh, pencil shape uh, kind of formation. And um, this is essentially the production from the field. Uh, since 2020, it has been flat. It was increased a little bit by I3, but really not material to their volumes. Increased from about 100 barrels to 200 barrels. Uh, actually, not even. It increased from about 100, from about 50 barrels to 75 or 80 barrels. So nothing really material, but the fact that it can stay there as a flat line uh, just adds to the valuation. And they got it for dirt cheap. So they got, um, I I want to say it was 15. Yeah, I don't I don't even have uh, I don't have the actual volume that they bought, but I want to say it was about 1500 BOEs um, that they bought. And uh, so that was pool number one that they bought. Uh, pool number two, this is their, um, the the gas from the uh, Clearwater acreage. We can see that it was completely shut in in 2018. So with gas prices being low, no more of that legacy gas production in the Clearwater was being depleted. And then I3 in, again, in Q2 2022, brought that back online and uh, looks like about about 200 BOEs per day of gas came online there. And this is this I refer to as a surge capacity. So when you when you increase the price of oil to levels that we haven't seen in decades, 100 plus dollars a barrel, 110, 120, North America seems to have about a three to five percent surge capacity on the conventional oil and even some of the fracked fracked volumes where there's wells that have been shut in for years and years and years, and then they got brought brought online. Doesn't mean the same volumes are gonna come on again the next time we go there, just because some of those wells did already come online in 2022. But when you leave oil prices low for three, four, five years, and then we get a high price, there is a surge that comes online. Uh, with that, I can speak this from experience. Any field I've ever operated, we had wells that were, Oh yeah, that well went down in 2016. It made 10 barrels per day. Um, it's not economic to bring online and do the work over 
until we hit $90 a barrel. Okay, and we just left it at that. Well, last year we did see $90 a barrel for multiple months. So some of those projects uh, did get sanctioned. Uh, this is the uh, the Carmen Gay field, I believe. And you can see how the it, it has a decline on it. But then over the last uh, couple of years, you can see here the top graph is well count. So the well count kept going down as wells went down. And now the well count is up again to basically its peak. This is one easy way to know is your company's fields at max production, max productive capacity or not. Just compare the well count from 2014 to the well count of 2022. If you still see a large gap there that tells you, okay, there's either wells that were abandoned or there's wells that still can be reactivated. If you see a large gap there, just look at the map of the field and see, okay, how many wells were abandoned versus how many wells are staying in suspended status. If there's still wells in suspended status, that tells you the next time oil is above $100 a barrel for six months, 12 months, 18 months, this company can go in, reactivate more wells and bring on more production at a very, very cheap capital efficiency. And those wells are gonna have a relatively lower decline once they get down to their uh, sustained production rate. So next one, Topaz and Advantage. Uh, before I begin, a quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events and uh, the Zoom link is on there. Uh, if not, the Twitter space will continue on with the audio. So April, 2020, this was a pretty unique transaction. Topaz, the uh, royalty arm of Tourmaline, of course, independent, but something that came out of Tourmaline uh, sold or Topaz bought a 12.5% interest in Advantage's Glacier gas plant. Um, very nice deal, $100 million for 12.5%. That tells you the total gas plant would be worth about $800 million. Not quite because Topaz doesn't pay any operating cost. So they had to pay a bit of a premium to get that sort of uh, deal done. But you can see the gas plant itself is worth five to $600 million. Now go look at Advantage Oil and Gas is uh, total enterprise value. And we can see how some of the infrastructure that's out there is still not being reflected in these gas focused companies and their enterprise values and their market caps. It's as if that asset is worth nothing, but we have deals that show what the asset is worth. And there's other deals as well that are not covered in this, uh, but somebody like a Paramount has actually sold roads and got 45 to $50 million for them. So transactions like this are nice because they, they, they validate what the, what the company is actually worth versus what the market is saying it's worth. And again, that's a very subjective statement, but that's, that's what creates uh, either an opportunity uh, to invest or a uh, basis that the company is fairly valued at a certain point in the future. So with this, uh, Advantage had to give up a 15-year volume commitment so no matter what, they have to pay for a processing on that 50 mmcf per day of, of, of gas for 15 years. Uh, and this is a one of the biggest gas plants in Canada. So 400 million standard cubic feet per day of raw gas and 6,800 barrels per day of liquids capacity. And it was expanded in six phases. So a little side note, most of the gas plants you will see that are being built right now or in the last five years, have a modular design. So they will have a straight pipeline going through the middle of the facility, and then you add on modules on the sides uh, as you want to grow this gas plant. A, a very clean design and opens it for future uh, increases as they go. This was likely a lesson learned from looking at some of the companies in the past that overbuilt gas processing, and then they didn't have any money to drill the wells, as we discussed with the IPCO core four, uh, but on the oil side. Uh, also, given that Advantage is linked up with Entropy, the, the Glacier gas plant is where the first and second modules uh, of the Entropy was installed. So this thing continues to generate uh, carbon credits and has a very, very low carbon emissions intensity, which is likely why Topaz wanted to, to partner up with this uh, in the first place. Uh, there's a fixed fee on the processing that's being given and no growth capital is required. So because Advantage already produces much higher volumes of gas. Uh, there's no real uh, a drill to fill or anything 
uh, on them. They just keep their production as is. And Advantage actually ended up benefiting here because although they're paying about 13 million uh, extra per year in processing fees, they ended up saving 8 million a year in interest. So the net change to them was only $5 million uh, at the end of the day. So you can see they sold this for 100 million. The net change was $5 million. They essentially sold it at a 5% cap rate or at 20 times uh, uh, adjusted funds flow. Great. If you can monetize your assets at, at that sort of uh, valuation, definitely makes sense to do so, especially in April 2020, when that $100 million went a long ways uh, towards making the balance sheet look a lot cleaner. And on Topaz side, they get about 12 to $13 million in incremental cash flow every single year. So they paid about eight times cash flow for this infrastructure asset. And we can say that was the rough uh, valuation for this kind of asset at the time. And we see here, Topaz is not, uh, is not responsible for operating or capital cost for its proportionate share of ownership. So they didn't buy a 12.5% a, a ownership. They bought a 12.5% working interest that comes with them not being responsible for any uh, operating or capital costs. And they paid eight times cash flow. Pretty good deal for both sides here. This is a very synergistic uh, acquisition. Next one, so we got Spartan and Bellatrix. So Spartan Delta, this was their first deal. They bought 25,000 BOEs per day for $100 million. So basically they paid 87 million in cash and they took on the liabilities for about $15 million, only $4,000 a flowing barrel. So Bellatrix was in deep, deep trouble uh, at the time. And Spartan came in, souped it up, uh, mostly gas, but still 30% liquids. So a lot of NGLs, but also uh, a little bit of oil that came with it and a huge infrastructure component um, here as well. Uh, and very, very clean asset, a 7.3 liability management rating, very nice asset. This will also become a theme as time goes on here. Many assets that transacted in 2020 and 2021 had a very high liability management rating. It was just easier to buy those sorts of things at that point, especially for companies that already had um, a lot of ARO within their corporation or for new companies like Spartan Delta uh, for whom they were able to really accelerate their uh, M&A strategy because they started off with an asset that was so clean uh, and had so much uh, LLR, had such a high uh, LMR rating. It also came with three a working interest in three gas plants. So very nice, big gas plants, 230 MMCF per day, uh, and one that's 96 MMCF per day, uh, a lot of compressor stations, gas gathering. Uh, Spartan also took on the joint venture uh, with the First Nation in the area, and uh, almost 700 square kilometers of 3D seismic. So, you know, we can say all this is worth nothing, but when we really compare it to other transactions that have gone on, it is worth something. For example, free, uh, sorry, uh, Prairie Sky Royalty had bought uh, 3D Seismic and there's a cost to that. Paramount sold roads, there's a cost to that. The pipeline sell, there's a cost to that. The processing gas plant sell, there's a cost to that. So when you add up the sum of the parts, some of these gas gasier companies um, definitely are worth more than what the market is saying. But again, that value, when does it get reflected? We don't quite know. Um, I will say Spartan Delta, as it sits today, only owns these Bellatrix assets for the most part. Yes, they bought a few little things here and there, but for the most part, the Spartan Delta that remains after the sale to Crescent Point of Montney and the spin out of Logan, the SDE that remains is mostly uh, these Bellatrix assets. And we can see what the... Today, the market cap of Spartan Delta is 773 million. So they effectively turned uh, this $100 million into a 773 million in three years. Very, very nice. Uh, you can say that was good management that added value to the, to the asset, or you can say they got a hell of a deal when they, when they first bought Bellatrix. Uh, I would say more the latter, but also some from the growth that Spartan Delta has done on these assets uh, over time. Uh, as we know, they've grown the production from 25,000 to almost 40,000 BOEs in those three years. So 
very, very impressive growth. We can see on the gas assets, their uh, actual, uh, um, where am I here? Their actual production here, which is the dotted line, is coming in much higher than the two type curves, even the higher type curve. Same on the uh, BOE production, so including gas and oil. Very good. Um, and the nice thing about these sorts of assets is it's ready to go. So the gas gathering compression was good for 45,000. So Bellatrix was essentially only operating it at about 55% of its capacity. Spartan was really able to grow production with very little new construction or processing or compression required. And um, they even tell you that 90% of future inventory requires no new surface construction or infrastructure spending. They got a killer deal on this asset. I think this would be uh, one of the best deals that was made uh, in 2020, if not the best deal alongside some of the deals that uh, I3 made uh, for some of their assets. So, okay, next, June 2020, we had the Longshore Consolidation. So Longshore Resources, a ARC financial company, at the time, the biggest oil and gas, Canadian oil and gas private equity fund in Canada. They had four companies, Longshore, Rifle Shot, Steelhead, and Primavera. Each four, five, 6,000, maybe even less BOEs per day, maybe 3,000 BOEs per day. What they did, smushed them all together and called the new entity Longshore, 14,000 BOE per day and 75% oil weighted, still backed by ARC Financial, but this was the first sign that they were looking to get out of the oil game. Uh, we will see with the with the subsequent transactions here that that Arc Financial is pretty much completely out of the oil game uh, at this point in time, oil and gas game. And uh, this was the first initial sign um, of that, and uh, really the first sign that the old school PE model was dead. So. We had the old school PE model, which was you back in a, a, a management team, you give them a few hundred million dollars, you say, go, they go and buy some sort of asset. They go and develop the asset. And once you're up to three, five, 7,000 BOEs per day, you sell the asset to a bigger producer. The new PE game or the new model that's working is the Strathcona model. You back a management team, and then you do a roll-up strategy. You keep buying assets within one corporation and just keep buying and buying and buying. That is the model that's really proven to be successful. The old school uh, PE model doesn't work for a variety of reasons, mainly that there is no market to buy these sorts of assets, um, but also because there's not enough land left. So previously you could have 40, 60, 80 of these companies running around in, in small little packages. Now, a lot of those packages are already within the bigger companies. They don't want to divest of them at two times cash flow or three times cash flow uh, because they want the inventory and there's not enough new organic opportunity out there uh, at this point in time. So uh, there's not the appetite for exploration drilling and going out and doing uh, delineation projects. It just is not, is not there. And the four different assets, Charlie Lake Oil, we now know to be in the top three, if not the top two uh, for economics in North America. Uh, Manville Oil, a tried and tested Manville stack, Sparky, uh, Cummings, Dyna, uh, Lodminster Pools, very nice. Viking Oil, you have your base, base asset and then a Montney Oil. So they got these four assets, put them into one and the company still exists today uh, with these four very nice acreage, uh, acreage blocks. Some of the wells we can see here, these are the Charlie Lake wells, seven to 800 barrels per day. So the way that the Charlie Lake is, is described, you get Montney level results for half the price. The DCET on these wells is $4 million, three and a half, whereas a Montney well will cost you six and a half, seven, especially some of the uh, longer multi-stage frack uh, Montney wells. Uh, we see some of the activity that Longshore is doing in the clear water. So when you merge together companies like this, you do end up with your main assets, but you always have a few wells here and there. You got random mineral rights in places. And as the industry develops, you may find that some of these blocks 
are actually quite uh, useful. So we see some, some uh, clear water work being done here uh, by Longshore. And we can see the overall asset actually has grown significantly. So in the last couple of years, because they've got this relatively new asset, a lot of inventory and the backing of ARC to go and increase to get that bigger scale, they've been able to grow oil production from 8,000 barrels per day to about 11,000 barrels per day uh, pre-COVID to now. And also the gas production has gone up a lot from about 22 MCF per day, uh, MMCF per day to about 40 MMCF per day. So nice little increase, uh, increasing about 10,000 BOEs roughly uh, over the, over the uh, last three years and potentially something that could uh, be on sale here um, given ARC Financial's history in wanting to exit. Um, it would be a nice asset for really any of these, call it, uh, uh, very scattered companies to go out and buy. So an I3, a Bonavista, uh, Saturn Oil, Cardinal, for companies like this, merging with this sort of uh, entity uh, actually makes sense. For somebody that's very consolidated and in one area, maybe they don't want the headache of all these different assets. I3 and Gain Energy. So right after I3 bought uh, Toscana in March, they went in June and they ended up buying Gain Energy. So uh, super cheap. They bought, um, what do we have here? So uh, 11,000 BOEs per day uh, for $80 million. Another very, very good asset. And they paid only about $5,000 per flowing BOE PD and only less than a dollar per BOE of 2P reserves uh, what they actually ended up doing right after the fact, and this is a pretty interesting how they did this, they reported on the deal, the company is closely following the global energy transition towards carbon neutral energy sources. Uh, and I3 intends to be a proactive participant in this critical endeavor. Okay. And what they're talking about is the working interest in the Weyburn CO2 unit operated by Whitecap. And what they say is the CO2 sequestered in their working interest portion can offset almost 18,000 BOEs of greenhouse emissions. Very noble, very professionally said, except two or three days later, they went and sold that, that working interest to Harvard Resources for uh, $45 million. So uh, it's, it's always extremely funny to me that companies continue to put out language uh, and also they will put out production targets and what they're doing next year and then go and make deals that obviously were already in the works or were very likely to happen. Um, it's a way to just try to protect themselves from people knowing what they're doing, yet it's so painfully obvious um, after the fact that it was just put in there as a token statement. <laughs> so uh, either way, Gain ended up buying these assets in... in uh, June of 2020, it was producing roughly, uh, so we got, uh, yeah, this is referring to one specific asset that they bought, but it, it was making 300 barrels per day and about seven MMCF, uh, six MMCF per day of gas. They've since led that decline. So we're now down to 200 barrels per day and about four and a half MMCF per day of gas. So another example, the company bought the asset, just left it. They're going to leave it for now. Uh, it doesn't make sense to go and drill these wells. They would rather drill in Simonette. They would rather drill in the clear water, but they got all this 2P reserve. They are making money off this asset and they were able to sell uh, a part of the asset to get more than half the money back that they paid. So overall, a really, really good deal. Um, I don't think they flipped it for a profit. Um, they Obviously, they made money on it. However, the reason they had to sell this was because I3 had very little money at this time. They had to go and raise this $80 million and they just realized that, hey, why don't we just raise $35 million uh, and, and sell this non-core thing because I3 being a, what they call themselves a consolidator and they wanna grow these assets. Well, the one asset you can't grow is the CO2 Weyburn flood because you don't operate the asset and 
there's no chance to consolidate that asset. The, there's there's so many partners there that are not going to sell, uh, sell you their portion, or if they do, they're going to want very high, uh, very high value for it. And I three is not one to pay high value for it. So it was a it was a stuck asset, and I mean very very good deal that they made to sell it right away. Uh, and uh, they, they sold it to a Saskatchewan based company. This uh, Harvard Resources is also a a, a very cool case study what they do, they they take the money from the Weyburn asset and they essentially deploy it into a exploration strategy. So they're they're just getting dividends coming in, cash flow coming in. They have to do nothing at CO2 uh, Weyburn. They just let it keep giving them money and then they go and deploy that towards exploration projects in Saskatchewan. Um, I actually ended up running into this uh, uh, just out of out of chance when I was looking at this about six or 12 months ago. And one of the one of the assets that came with the uh, gain transaction was the modern Wapiti or the gain Wapiti Cardium. This was the asset that I worked for about a year and a half in uh, 2019, all the way until 2021 when we were bought out by Tourmaline. Another transaction I will discuss as I go. But uh, since we're on the topic, um, I want to share a few pictures from my time there just to give people a understanding of uh, what actually goes on in the field. So uh, here is the Gain Wapiti asset. They, unfortunately, the mistake that Gain made, they ended up drilling one well into the water zone. So the Wapiti Cardium is extremely special in that it is 100% oil. There is no, not a single drop of formation water in the uh, Wapiti Cardium. When we drill these wells, you do produce water, the reason being because the wells were fracked with water. So you can run tests on that fracked water and it tells you, okay, it's the same water that was injected downhole. There's no formation water uh, that comes in. But when you have these kinds of fields, you have a kind of a evil that goes with it, which is there's a squiggly line that is never straight. Uh, it's always random. And it the, the Wapiti Cardium becomes almost 100% water in the space of half a mile or one mile. And Gain made the mistake of drilling into the water zone, uh, screwed up one of their very, very early wells, and it kind of really stunted them from ever developing this asset uh, to their full nature. And we at Modern unfortunately made the same mistake where one of our wells went into the water side. Um, and it was a obviously a mistake, but at the time the mapping was not clear enough uh, to really identify where exactly the end was. We did a bunch of uh, analysis on this well and found that most of the water was coming from the last third or two thirds of the well, which is now obvious looking at the uh, latest mapping on this. And just something to keep in mind with, with some of your companies, um, it's not always cookie cutter. Yes, we we try and drill these wells so they're always on, on type curve, but not not always the case especially in new areas. So with us getting the new acreage with lots of inventory, some of the acquisitions we've discussed, uh, you also deal with unfortunate incidents where certain wells will cave in, certain wells will hit water, certain wells will go into the gas side. Uh, certain places, you've got a structural fault that comes in um, that's unidentified. So definitely want to keep in mind, uh, here is how the Wapiti Cardium looks today. Uh, we have the... A blue being I3. We have the red being uh, white cap. No, the red is tourmaline and, and the green is white cap. So a couple of deals made here. Uh, tourmaline acquired this from modern, obviously. Uh, very, very waxy oil. So this here you see is a, a de-waxing swab unit, um, a farm boys oil field. And you can see what's what's coming out of the well is supposed to be liquid oil. What's actually coming out of the well is straight asphaltine wax. Um, this tends to happen in some of these uh, cardium formations uh, that have a higher quantity of these sorts of uh, uh, different carbon chains and uh, very cool to treat. One of my projects was uh, trying to figure out how to fix this. So we ran solvents, we ran inhibitors, uh, we ran dispersants, ran these uh, de-waxing knives, uh, gauge rings, all, all kinds of equipment. 
uh, to try and fix this this problem and it it comes and goes so uh very very uh very interesting project that nobody quite yet has solved uh if somebody who's listening to this wants to make multi millions of dollars if you find the solvent or the inhibitor that can fix this problem it can be applied to large parts of the canadian oil patch and many 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 companies are still trying um today um to do so and I'll have more pictures of my time at Modern as a presentation uh, as the presentation goes on, um, just because it's uh, cool and why not share while we're on the topic. So next one, Conoco and Kelt. This was a one of the biggest transactions that happened in the COVID era. So when I say COVID era, basically uh, summer of 2020, when things were completely unknown uh, for the most part as to how the world would rebound and how fast it would rebound. So Kelt bought, or ConocoPhillips bought this, uh, bought this Kelt acreage, Inga, uh, Fireweed, $510 million. Very nice. And they also took on some obligations of about $41 million, um, but very good deal for Conoco, very good deal for Kelt, because Kelt maintained their lands at Oak, Flat Rock, uh, Alberta, as well as many, many other uh, places. They were able to monetize 27% only of the company's Montney acreage. And you can see here, the production went down from 31,000 to 16,000. So about a 46% loss in production, but the Montney acreage only went down 27%. They still have all their Charlie Lake asset and the bank debt went from 310 million to zero. The working capital went from minus 35 million to plus 75 million. So a very nice transaction, especially to do so during the COVID time. Uh, Kelt therefore became a pretty much a risk-free company at that point. So no bank debt, 75 million extra working capital to use to increase production again. And it's not like they sold all their production. They only lost 46% of the production. They only lost uh, 73, or they only lost 27% of the Montney rights. Awesome. Another very synergistic win-win transaction. Uh, we can see here some of the gas rates uh, out of this pool. So uh, unfortunately the date here got cut off, uh, but this was during COVID. We had the production fall down and then ramped up again. And Conoco is holding it flat about 88 uh, MMCF per day right now. And on top of that, the reason this was such a good deal was Conoco got the gas plant already there. So they didn't own the gas plant, but Alta Gas, was constructing a almost a 200 MMCF per day gas plant in the area. And Conoco was waiting for this uh, to go through. And as soon as we had that getting very, very close or started, the bang, the deal was made. And it uh, it it goes it goes very similar to what Kelt is doing right now. Prove out an, a nice little area, build out some infrastructure with it, and sell it with 15, 20,000 BOEs of production, the ability to ramp but also decades of inventory uh, that comes with it. Um, okay. So there's a question here. Did you guys frack with hot water at Wapiti? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that, but um, anecdotally, I will tell you that hot water and steam was helping us on the surface. So if we wanted the first 100 meters or first 80 meters of the well cleaned out, I would inject steam down the casing and uh, we would try and melt the wax from the outside of the tubing inwards. Uh, but it was creating more problems because the one, the one very curious thing about wax, and it's not hard to really realize why, but is if you have wax and you, you already have a downhole and you put hot water down, you melt the wax. If some part of that wax doesn't come back or, or, or doesn't come up to surface, now that wax gets harder and harder and it gets heavier and heavier because you're always melting the lighter ends first and you're always producing the lighter ends first. So we really tried to avoid uh, putting heat into the formation. Unfortunately, the, the modern Wapiti Cardium formation is just naturally under, uh, under temp of what it should be for that, for that part of the world. 
Um, but every time that we tried to run any sort of heat downhole, uh, it just created more problems because we we just can't produce all the oil uh, or all the wax all at once uh, and, and end up getting those massive slugs, as you saw in the picture. Um, so essentially what we did, we would put 1,000 to 2,000 liters of solvent downhole. It would sit there, uh, try, try and take in as much of the wax as possible, and then produce it all at once. Uh, try and really lift lift all these. Never a perfect solution, though, which is why the uh, opportunity is still out there for anybody uh, looking to get into that business. The next one, Skin RL Painted Pony, one of the best deals. I'm I'm not going to say the best deal, but uh, from a shareholder perspective, uh, I did hold Painted Pony. Um, was not happy with the with the selling price. Uh, about a whoops. Uh, so 69 cents per share that was paid along with $350 million of debt uh, that was taken on in this transaction. Uh, the, the, the shares were really not worth that much at this point in time, uh, given that the company was under a debt load, um, about 270 MMCF per day of gas and 4,600 barrels per day of NGL. So they bought roughly, I want to say 40 to 50,000 uh, BOEs per day and paid 500-ish million uh, dollars for it. And Penny Pony, why was it such a great company? Because it had not just the production and the infrastructure, but they had the fourth largest natural gas reserves of any company in Canada, any any publicly traded company in Canada. So compared to other companies that were still delineating their land, that were still drilling all kinds of wells, Penny Pony already had the uh, land. They, they uh, effectively had as much reserve as Aventive. So Aventive being a $40, $50 billion company. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the EV is right now, but multi, multi tens of billions of dollar company. Uh, so lots of reserves here got, got taken over by CNRL at a very cheap price and um, right on the pipeline as well. Penny Pony was definitely north. So they were suffering uh, because they were injecting into a pipeline that was relatively higher pressure. Didn't stop them though. They had something like 55 or 60 of the top 100 wells in Canada uh, over the last few years. So definitely very, very nice land. And the the real problem that 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 frustrates investors was that the company was not really in in debt trouble. They had 46 million of convertible debentures, which could have been converted. Uh, they had 143 million in senior unsecured notes that were not due till 2022. And on their on their bank line uh, credit facility, they had only 138 million out on a 375 million syndicated credit facility. So, could we argue that the credit facility would have been pulled, therefore taking the company under, a la Bonavista? Possibly, but it's it's just a difficult difficult argument to make uh, when you're only a third drawn, and the company seemed to have other sources. Uh, of lending as well. I think things could have been done, but the easy way out was taken and CNRL uh, therefore benefited uh, in this case. Penny Pony, we can see the share price chart was trading about $10 a share in 2016 and fell all the way down to about 20 cents. And uh, eventually, even though it hit 85 cents in June of 2020, it got sold for 69 cents in uh, June slash July. Uh, shortly thereafter. So uh, very unfortunate for Penny Pony shareholders, very fortunate for CNRL shareholders. Uh, you can see how far some of these gas stocks have fallen given the collapse in gas pricing and also the general lack of belief in a, uh, a natural gas scarce environment anymore because of the volumes of Montney and Duvernay and even gas in the US uh, that was able to be produced in a very, very short cycle uh, kind of way. And um, this was an excellent trading stock in 2020, made a lot of money off this. And uh, one of the curious kind of trade trading uh, things that was happening was crew energy would always trade at 66% of the price of Penny Pony. It was such a bizarre correlation, but if you if you map out uh, crew versus Penny Pony for the last three years, uh, well, three years before they got bought out, you will see 
Painted Pony would trade at three, Crew would trade at two. That was effectively the ratio, three to two uh, or 1.5 to one uh, on those two shares. And, and I would use that to trade back and forth between Crew and Painted Pony um, until obviously this thing got bought out. And uh, that was that. Yeah, there's a comment here that says it was a highway, uh, highway robbery. Yeah, yeah. Because it wasn't just production. Like the production getting sold at 10,000 flowing barrel, fine. But the reserve and the land base that went with it was absolutely pristine. Um, and again, the problem wasn't that the company got bought out for highway robbery. It was there looked to be a better way out um, if they had just waited um, a few months. Maybe they didn't have that luxury. Okay. On we go. So white cap NAL, $155 million deal and 27,000 BOEs per day for just $155 million. I think many of us, myself included, forget that white cap was a not, not that big of a company pre-COVID. Like, yeah, they had a lot of assets. They had a bunch of inventory, but it, it really wasn't a big company. Uh, it was relatively smaller size compared to your, your crescent points of the world. Um, it was in even smaller than Baytex at the time. And now it's become the biggest uh, in, in that little group, uh, obviously before the CPG Spartan Delta transaction, but roughly on par even now, uh, very, very nice deal here. Uh, bought this bought this at about $6,000 a flowing barrel, 55% uh, oil and NGL. And Manulife uh, owned about 12.5% of the entity once it got combined, since they owned a lot of the NAL shares, which then had a lockup agreement on it. Uh, for those who remember, uh, Whitecap ended up uh, block buying one of these back uh, when they got released, but the lockup definitely did, did help in that it didn't restrict the stock from going up uh, as we saw the recovery from COVID. So very nice deal here. And pro for, or white caps production went up from about 60,000 BOEs to about 85,000 BOEs. So they bought this NAL asset at 27,000. They let it decline to 22,000. Didn't spend the capital to keep production flat. They just let it decline. Uh, they ended up getting some additional CO2 projects as well here. Uh, given that NAL had exposure to that and the assets were quite close already um, as you can see here with NAL in blue white cap in green very nice synergy they they owned uh, assets that were adjacent to each other uh, 84 percent of lands overlapped um, also got some nice uh, production in the in the um, southern southern ish Alberta cardium and uh, uh, cardium slash gloconite and we can see these wells really good. Now that Whitecap has finally come in and started drilling some of their NAL acreage, you're seeing Glock wells at uh, almost a thousand barrels per day. And even a year down the road are producing 350 plus barrels per day. So uh, some of these assets that got bought, um, I've, I've kind of stressed this point to the point of beating it. Um, some of the assets that got bought weren't properly capitalized from 2014 to 2020. So a lot of new technologies came online, but the companies that had these assets were stuck under high debt loads. Um, they were stuck doing work on their other uh, acreages. They didn't really want to go and do exploration work or drill these longer wells. Now, the assets that were bought in that period by bigger companies like Whitecap, they can go in and selectively find really, really, really nice uh, diamonds in the rough on those assets. So don't be surprised to see more of this in a higher oil price environment. The companies that bought assets, they're not going to go and, and, and take risks in a $70, $72 oil environment. They're just going to wait. When the time comes, they'll go and drill these and end up showing people what they've been missing so far on uh, kind of, again, doing this rear view analysis uh, on, well, the asset never did this, the asset never did that. Well, oil price for six years averaged $50 a barrel. So what do you really want the companies to go out and, and, and increase production uh, in those sorts of uh, price environments? Likely not. Uh, okay, so yeah, not much more on that. A, a, a very nice deal. 
Uh, one thing to always keep in mind with these all stock transactions is obviously they paid in stock. So even though they only paid 6,000 a flowing barrel, if the, if the price of white cap stock has tripled or 4X'd in the last three years since the transaction closed, you can see how they effectively paid on today's pricing a much higher price. It's not fair to go and uh, look at the transactions that way, but that is the true cost of the transaction because those shares exist today. So uh, effectively, if the share today is $9, $10 a share, and you issued X amount of shares, that's essentially what the value is of the company uh, that you paid for. And Whitecap did quite a few of these deals, uh, but unfortunately did not buy back as many shares as something like an ARC Resources was able to based on their transactions, which we will also discuss here uh, as we go on. So Synovus Husky, not gonna talk about this very much. It's a major deal. Uh, there's, there's way too much to discuss, but the main uh, things here, $3.8 billion of all stock. Again, this was issued at roughly five and a half to $6 a share of Synovus. So that was worth uh, $3.8 billion worth of shares were created. If that share now is 3X what it was then, again, you can do the math in that sense. Also $20 billion of debt was taken on. So Husky really struggling at the time, uh, bought a bunch of assets, didn't really have the money, uh, really got screwed there uh, uh, when COVID hit, especially with their with their oil being very heavy oil. Um, when the deal closes, Synovus would own 61% uh, of the entity. Husky shareholders own 39%. And of that, um, Lee, uh, Lee Ka-Sheng, who owned the majority of Husky, uh, ended up owning a 16% stake in the new company. And this was a deal that Husky shareholders liked. They got 17% uh, uh, increase in price uh, the day after the deal was announced. Sonova slumped 14%. So one company here uh, got the better end of the deal just because the price paid was a premium when you look at the stock transaction uh, ratios. And essentially 750,000 barrel per day producer was created, a new blue chip company. Uh, you had upgrading and refining of 660,000 barrels per day and uh, takeaway capacity, 265,000 barrels, more capacity on pipelines and 16 million of storage. You can see here the share ratio that it was. So Husky shareholders got 0.78 uh, of each common share of Synovus per Husky share and 0 0.065 of a a share warrant. These warrants were exceptional trading vehicles all the way from 2020 to 2021 uh, because they had a $6.54 uh, Canadian strike on it. The share of, of uh, Synovus was trading seven, eight, ten dollars $10. So you got this very juicy warrant, uh, a warrant-like option uh, that had a five-year optionality on it. So exceptional trading uh, vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, may not be any longer because Synovus price has gone up a lot. And also just last month, Synovus announced the repurchase of 84% of these outstanding warrants. So they bought back 84% of what was remaining. They paid $700 million for it. Again, when we go and revalue these transactions, were they good deals, were they bad deals? When it's a stock deal, the way I look at it is what is that stock worth today? What is that warrant worth today? So at the time, the deal was a $24 billion deal. If we convert it to what it was worth today, it's about a $33 to $34 billion deal. Um, very subjective. I'm not saying just because I do it that way means everybody needs to do it that way. Um, but I just feel like the stock is valued at what it's valued today. Um, here is the same information given earlier in uh, table form, uh, 9 billion BOE of 2P reserves came with this. Uh, Husky having more upgrading and refining than their production. Synovus having less, the pro forma company having an almost one-to-one -one ratio. So really worked out good for Synovus on the downstream side uh, and the upgrading side of things. And here's a map. So you can see they got, uh, of course, all the, all the assets um, that Synovus already had. Christina Lake, Foster Creek, the gems of the uh, oil sands, uh, along with the deep basin, Martin Hills and whatnot. 
And then with Husky, you got most of the Lloyd Minster thermals uh, along with refineries in the US and then all kinds of conventional assets and then Sunrise and Tucker. Tucker since, since then has been sold. Sunrise, they've uh, taken over all the uh, working interests in Sunrise since then um, going forward. And Husky also had the assets in Asia. So the offshore uh, China and offshore Indonesia uh, platforms as well. So I won't talk too much about that deal. There's a, too many moving parts. Um, whether that deal was a good deal or not is still, the jury is still out. Um, we'll, we'll find out over the next few years uh, how that ends up treating them. But definitely it spurred a change in mindset from Synovus. They, 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 Synovus really became a debt repayment company at that time. Uh, to start off, they were a relatively clean balance sheet. Uh, then they acquired the Conoco assets. Uh, they ended up getting a bit of debt on the balance sheet. They were repaying that debt. Then they got another 20 billion of debt on the, uh, on the balance sheet uh, with this transaction. So, so really they said, okay, we're gonna make this big splurge, buy this bigger fish. And then now we really have to focus on repaying debt as opposed to going out and uh, doing any sort of expansions, which as a uh, shareholder, not as a shareholder, as an investor in oil and gas, great. If the companies that have the assets that can increase production are not able to, good. Keep them, keep them locked in so that we don't see any increased supply until we really see the pricing regime um, that dictates that uh, increase in supply. So tourmaline, Jupiter. So Tourmaline made the transactions at the same time. They bought Jupiter and Modern on the same day. Jupiter was a gas-focused company uh, down in the Kakwa car um, area. Uh, about $630 million of total uh, pay, 67,000 BOEs of production. Mostly gas, but about 20,000 of condensate and NGLs on it as well, and 500 sections of land. So very, very cheap acquisition. At this point, gas was absolutely in the gutter. Um, I feel bad for these companies because if they just held on another six months or so, uh, gas was recovering by 2021. And then we obviously saw the huge spike running into 2022. Um, so unfortunate timing for Jupiter, good timing for Tourmaline. Uh, they also got working interest in uh, two operated gas plants and one non-operated gas plant, which obviously you want when you have gas production. You want you want the plants to already be there so you can drill them uh, to fill them. And the biggest thing here, because Tourmaline was so much bigger than Jupiter, they were able to drill and complete wells for 40% cheaper. This was really the, the, the anchor on the foot of a lot of these smaller gas companies, they could not drill wells cheap because they were competing with Tourmaline. They were competing with Obvintiv. They were competing with seven generations in the area. Uh, they're competing with Arc Resources. These small companies just had to pay way more to drill these wells. And these gas wells are not cheap. These are seven, eight, 10 to $12 million uh, drills. And for a company like Tourmaline to come in, save 40% right away, you can see how that plays out over 500 sections of land as uh, the cycle continues. Just by doing that, they're able to get much, much better uh, economics um, on it. And there was, at the time they bought these assets, there was one rig uh, on the modern resource land and two rigs uh, on the Jupiter assets that were going to be created. So come in, buy the land, increase production right away. And Jupiter's four largest shareholders uh, owned 92% of the company. So it was effectively a done deal right away. Uh, I believe Apollo was one of the biggest ones here and uh, did not end up doing well on this. Uh, don't quote me on that. I don't know for sure, uh, but they really wanted to get out. They were having, the board of directors was changing every few months. There was one individual who I believe got fired. Um, and then and then this company was just not, not in the right uh, a space to really continue on especially when your PE backers just want out uh, right away. So great deal uh, for Tourmaline, definitely. Uh, you can see the uh, Jupiter lands here in red. The previous acquisitions that uh, uh, Tourmaline made in blue as well here, 
So this is some of the modern land along with some of the other uh, transactions that were made and the behemoth tourmaline was created. So with this, I believe they got to about 300,000 plus uh, BOEs per day, really on the path towards the next transactions that they made, which we will also discuss here. And uh, they said they would have a cumulative free cash flow exceed the what they paid for the transaction by 2026. I think they have got there already with the huge, huge premium they got in 2022 uh, on some of these uh, uh, gassy wells. So really good uh, on it and um, very high condensate yields, very high NGL yields on this. This land was, was a very nice uh, land, relatively clean asset and a lot of wells uh, still to be drilled and lots of reserves still in the ground. It was, it was relatively a new area. Uh, it's also very, very close to where Whitecap bought the XTO land, which also we will discuss here um, as time goes on. This graph here is just the Jupiter wells that were bought. So it doesn't include any new drills that Tourmaline did on those lands. You can see relatively nice decline rate. So compared to some of the other uh, acreage that's out there, gassy acreage that declines much faster, um, Jupiter had, had already sort of kept production flat for about a year at the time that Tourmaline bought it. So this really helps. If you're buying an asset that the production went up 50% the year before you bought it, you're gonna suffer from a hard decline rate on that legacy asset. If you buy an asset that's been held flat for a year or two before you bought it, your decline rate is going to be much more mitigated. So some of the things that uh, I think is important to look at when your company or your, your a company you're invested in makes a transaction, don't just look at, what did they pay per flowing barrel or the cash flow multiple? There are so many other things to look at, which is why I find it fascinating uh, about, about all the very strong claims made on acquisitions right off the bat. So you see an acquisition announced and two hours later on Twitter, there's, there's somebody that has a very strongly held view already um, as, as to what the uh, uh, transaction was good or bad. It's very hard to say, uh, I believe, until multiple weeks down the road. And even when you want to look at something as, as a real uh, uh, good or bad acquisition, you really need to wait for a few years uh, to see what kind of commodity price environment we end up in. Because uh, that really is what changes the metrics on a lot of these assets. Uh, we can also see the uh, oil production here, um, unfortunately not reported. So because these wells are, are reported on a facility basis, we don't know what the oil rates are. And again, something that leads to a lot of confusion uh, when these transactions happen for gas companies. Keep in mind, the way liquids are reported in Alberta, um, you may not see the well-by-well -well, um, re reporting of the production when you're trying to look at acquisitions and trying to figure out were they good or not. Modern resources. So Tourmaline on the same day bought Modern, they paid $144 million for it, about 12,000 BOEs, uh, mostly gas, but also about 2,000-ish of oil uh, that came, the Wapiti Cardium. The rest was, as we see here, the gas acreage. And we see here up top, the oil acreage that was bought. Um, a quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, and you can join us. Uh, for the things here, the, the slides that I'm talking about. Um, so a little bit more here. Modern Resources was uh, owned by ARC Financial and NCAP um, out, uh, out of Texas. Uh, I believe out of Texas, I want to say. And then Jupiter there, it does say Apollo uh, Global Management. So another exit by ARC Financial here. Again, kept the um, signs going that they were looking to get outside of the PE game going forward. Um, owned infrastructure. So Modern owned the seven of nine uh, route gas plant, a phenomenal property, state of the art. Uh, most of the things automated, uh, very, very low emissions because of the way that Modern Resources was run. Um, and 
about 125 mmcf per day gas plant so if you were to build this gas plant today it would cost you 150 million dollars tourmaline bought modern for 144 million dollars you can see the disconnect that occurs when we talk about gas focused transactions so companies are not just buying production they're not just buying reserves they're 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 not just buying land they're also buying the physical asset that's in place a quick and easy math to do is look at the mmcf per day of what the gas plant is multiply it by somewhere between 1.2 and two. That's what it would cost you to build that gas plant today. So that's how much value was sitting there um, and, and Tourmaline realized. So again, a fantastic deal. And Arc Financial just wanted out. Same with NCAP. NCAP has been selling many of their other portfolio companies as well over the last couple of years. And we see how modern grew. So only about a thousand BOEs per day in late 2014 got up to about 12,000 BOEs per day by the time this sold in late 2020. So certain companies were still growing during that depressed uh, commodity price environment. We're not likely to, to see this anymore. What is the telltale sign? The Permian and the shale rigs being dropped even at $70 oil and $2.50, $3 gas. So a, a big change in mindset. And also these kinds of companies are just not being backed anymore. I, I spoke earlier about the change in the private equity model moving forward. So these kinds of companies are just not getting backed anymore. The only one I've seen out there right now uh, is called Signet Energy, and they've got a $500 million check. And it's been sitting there for about a year. They have not been able to find, it seems like, the asset or close on any deal quite yet. So even the ones that are getting funded, they're not just going out there and buying assets. They're having to wait and find the right thing. Really, the PE companies are, are very stringent and strict as to what they're allowing them to buy. Uh, rather than five years ago or seven years ago, here you go, $300 million, go, go do whatever with it, and we'll sell you in five years. That, that model uh, is just not working. A um, couple of things that made modern very, very, uh, uh, what I would call state of the art environmentally conscious. Uh, a lot of our pads were run with solar. So for all the flack the oil and gas industry gets about uh, pollution and whatnot, they are the ones that are well ahead of the curve uh, in doing a lot of the things that are then mandated um, after the fact. They Whatever makes sense economically and whatever makes sense with the government credits will get done. So especially with new companies like this, uh, we see all, all our pad sites were run with uh, with solar and we ran electric pumps, which means no emissions from the pneumatic fuel gas uh, that was being used. Um, I won't bore everybody here, but um, there's some information on the mule site, uh, a modern ultra low emission uh, site. And, and this is all stuff that the oil industry does. And I love sharing it because we get, again, we keep getting the flack that we're out there spilling oil on the ground, emitting and flaring, and it's just not the case. Uh, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, uh, people who already support the industry. So um, not much that can be said, but he, uh, here's the, the ex-CEO um, of Modern, Chris, and then James, uh, who was the uh, guy who hired me at Modern. So uh, now at Advantage, uh, Jim Strange, he was the facilities engineer working on a lot of these projects with me. And then Mike, uh, our field soup, very, very tight-knit team. Um, as I said, as I promised, I'll share some pictures of my time there. Here we are on a uh, de-waxing job. We got two rigs going, um, de-waxing these wells. We also have a little pressure truck and a steam unit. So talked earlier about steaming down the backside of these wells uh, in order to get uh, some of the wax out. So a nice little operation that was ran here. Um, and for those that, that wonder um, why operating cost is so expensive, um, this little operation here is going to cost me somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500 an hour. So we are looking at a very expensive equipment and to sell oil at $40 or $45 a barrel or, or even $60 or $70 a barrel is a complete joke um, in my opinion, but I'm biased. 
Um, here is us in the winter, uh, very interesting climate uh, out there, obviously in the bush. And we had these hydraulic pump jacks. Uh, so four different wells here running and each making about somewhere between 50 and 60 barrels per day uh, of oil. And you can see a very clean operation. We don't, we don't have uh, large uh, gearboxes or flare stacks or, 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 or anything like that here. Uh, very nice operation. Of course, lots of wildlife uh, links in the area. You can see the, the three little links uh, running around. Uh, we used to always stay in your truck as much as possible. Uh, of course, try and explore, but don't be going around, uh, uh, walking around in the bush unnecessarily. Uh, we see two little moose, uh, moose with a baby. Very, very, very aggressive. Uh, don't want to be getting close to these uh, either. Um, a little couple of pictures of my truck. So you can see the different kinds of equipment uh, that we used to carry. Uh, this little rat pack, we call it, was uh, hand-built and a um, little bottle opener there on the side as well. So once you get back to Grand Prairie, you go and crack a beer right there, uh, sit outside and uh, barbecue. So uh, interesting life out there. Uh, we had our oil, oil jugs, battery cables, um, a, a little shop vac for uh, cleaning up anything that would spill inside our facilities. Uh, the little side-by-side -side that I carried, uh, Polaris Ace 900, uh, 900 cc engine on this little thing lots of fun um and you can see the kind of uh weather that we used to operate in so uh something like the wildfires is is just one thing but excessive rain snow lightning strikes um uh, huge mud lot, lots of things uh happen out there which is what leads to delays so i'm definitely a lot more accepting when i hear the drilling rig got delayed three days or the work over got delayed two days. It happens. Uh, this is not a video game. Um, this you can see here, my my little uh, fender flare is off because I ended up falling into the ditch and a uh, big, big rock went right there and uh, peeled this entire thing off. Uh, this truck is now in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, sold to somebody there who hopefully didn't know about its uh, oil and gas past life. Um, uh, but didn't care anyway because I got a good price for it. So uh, either way, uh, a few other ones. We had a nice little, we also had bears on site. So black bears and grizzly bear as well. And uh, me and my little ATV, here is us in our truck when the roads would get bad. Then we took the ATV out because you don't want to be beating around your, your vehicle. Um, caused lots of damage very, very fast, uh, even in four wheel drive. So took this little thing out. Um, and uh, checked all our sites using this. Uh, for those that are wanting some more information about life in the oil patch, um, I've actually got about an hour and a half long video on my YouTube uh, where I had a GoPro set up on this and I recorded myself and you can see me doing commentary uh, after the fact. And uh, it's it's on my YouTube. It's called Wapiti um, Field Tour or something. So a little bit more of that. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Um, I do have other GoPro videos that I plan to put out uh, in the next few months um, and, and basically do like a color commentary on it, explaining things as I go. I uh, find it quite fascinating, but um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see when they come out. Um, okay, so the next one, Headwater Synovus. So Synovus got the Martin Hills acreage that they had. They sold it to Headwater in late 2020, about 2,800 barrels per day. Uh, at the time operating 270 net sections. And Synovus did something interesting. They took some cash, but they took a lot uh, a lot of shares, 50 million shares of Headwater that made them about a 27% owner and 15 million warrants as well at a very, very low strike with a three-year term. So it gave them long duration optionality. Um, and then what happened was Synovus, after the fact, uh, sold those 50 million shares for about $228 million. So basically they got 228 million plus the 35 million plus the warrants, which ended up making them uh, roughly 40-ish million dollars. So a total of about $300 million for 2,800 barrels per day of production. Pretty good uh, because they participated in the upside and they in fact sold too early uh, because Headwater now trades at even a higher price. And we can see here their acreage uh, oh yeah, here's the headwater chart. Very good. 
uh, when this deal was initially announced, Headwater was roughly $1.50 ish per share and went as high as seven and a half, now trading at $6.75 a share. And we can see the Martin Hills acreage that they got um, here uh, in yellow. And then we can see it overlaying on the net pay map. So what do we see here? A few sections in the absolute core of Martin Hills. And then we have a few sections to the side here on the west side. Why is it important? Well, let's look at it a little bit more closely. The section that's right in the core of Martin Hills has been the sections that Headwater has used to increase their production massively, as you see here on the bottom. Production has gone from 2,800 barrels per day to more than 15,000 barrels per day, mostly on the back of this uh, Martin Hills production and then some over to the west side here going towards Nipissee, but mostly in the western Martin Hills. What does this tell you about the production profile of Sonova or of Headwater going forward? They've drilled up more than half of their major core acreage in order to get to 15,000, which means if they want to sustain 15,000, they're going to have to drill this acreage up even faster. What do they have left? They still have pretty good Barton Hills acreage left. But the net pay map tells you it's not right in the meat of Martin Hills. So the wells are likely to be a little bit less uh, as prolific. So just something to keep in mind, um, companies will target their best acreage first when they wanna grow. Companies will target their best acreage when they want to sell. When they want to jack up production and look for an exit, they will drill their best acreage. If you're investing in companies like this, you have to be careful of using the same capital efficiencies of the first two years towards the future. Look at the acreage. Where are they drilling? What kind of acreage do they have left? And you will get a better understanding of which companies have the assets, which companies can grow the assets, and then which companies just don't have it. It's going to be declining. And I'm not saying by any means that Headwater is running out of acreage, but something to keep in mind, they, they have drilled more than half of their meat of the acreage. So when we look at trying to understand whether m and was good or not, this deal was by far a win for Headwater. It was a win for Synovus. This asset might've gotten stuck, uh, undercapitalized within Synovus. Headwater came in and really grew production. Uh, but when we're looking at deals on a full cycle basis, we really need to see the impacts of it for multiple years down the road and the inventory quality with it. Um, okay. There's a question here. Did you do surge yet? Um, there's no index. I'm actually going chronologically. So we're now in December, 2020. Uh, we will be going all the way till the recently announced Spartan Delta Crescent Point acquisition. Um, but I want to say we're about halfway through here. Uh, just given that a lot of the deals occurred in 2020 uh, and early 2021. And I think if we go past the three hour mark, uh, we'll take a little break, a uh, five, 10 minute break. Uh, until then, we will keep uh, chugging along here and uh, keep going. Yeah. So white cap and torque, another great deal. $900 million was paid, uh, all, all share deal, um, other than obviously the debt that got taken on and a immediate dividend increase, which always gets investors happy. Um, and again, all shares. So keep in mind that as those shares have appreciated in price, the deal value itself has also gone up. Um, very nice base decline rate, 17%. Why? Because 67% of the asset acquired was under water flood. So you know I'm a big fan of these water floods. And uh, Torque had a lot of these. Again, the shares were locked up three, six, and nine months. Uh, about 25,000 BOEs was bought. And once again, White Cap let the production decline to 22,000 rather than aggressively keep capital going um, while also increasing their float 
and they want to also pay a big dividend as well. So a uh, pretty interesting way that Whitecap did all, did all of this. Um, and I'm sure down the road, um, they will they will be definitely rewarded for it. Um, but they did create a lot of shares by paying with this all, all, uh, all stock transactions. Uh, a little map here. So most of the asset in southeastern Saskatchewan consolidated in that area. Torque Oil and Gas obviously being a Brett Herman ran company who then went and started Lucero uh, right underneath this asset in the Williston Basin, uh, North Dakota. A um, couple of the assets here. So we have uh, one of the asset, again, we see they're letting it decline once they bought it. Um, here is the overall pro forma letting it decline as well. But this, this again only includes the wells, the legacy wells. And once again, a company that wasn't really increasing production in the last couple of years. I like buying assets like that, not ones that you're buying at the peak of some sort of flush production uh, rate. We see here, shares went up about 50%. So Whitecap standalone, 409 million shares outstanding. Pro forma, 597 million shares outstanding. Definitely one uh, that we will see the impact of this as time goes on. We will also see the impact depending on how many shares Whitecap can buy back over time um, and also how much dividend they're paying over time because the more shares you have, the more dollars in, in terms of raw dollars uh, goes towards your dividend, whether it's 5%, 6%, 7% uh, on that uh, kind of market cap. Production also has run up. So we went from 60,000 to 100,000. Now keep in mind, this is both deals, NAL plus torque, 100,000. Capital wasn't really increased that much because again, they're letting production decline and the dividend went up marginally, but any dividend increase is rewarded or was being rewarded at the time uh, by shareholders. Uh, we see here some of the hedges that were being made. So uh, White Gap took on, uh, took on some hedges that came on with these companies. Um, nothing really too crazy, but I will say we often forget where we were just two years ago. Look at these hedges. Swaps are being hedged at $58 to $63 a barrel Canadian. We trade today $95 to $100 Canadian per barrel. So the oil industry, yes, it's very volatile. Yes, it moves up and down very, very fast. At the same time, we have to be cognizant that we had multiple years. And even in 2021, uh, when everybody was all excited about the oil industry, we were, we were at 58 to $60 Canadian uh, at certain points in the year. And in fact, for a lot of the year, uh, we were in, in that sort of time. The, these hedges probably did end up losing money, but at the same time, we were there. Today, we are at $95 to $100 a barrel on our way towards much higher um, as the cycle continues. Okay, we're in 2021. So Spartan and Inception. So Spartan Delta, along with making Bellatrix, this was their next deal. They bought Inception Exploration for uh, about $100 million. So Inception is right here, just south of the town of Grand Prairie. It was an asset that kind of got stuck in the wrong company and uh, it was a very sour asset, very close to town. Inception didn't really have the money for it. The Monty was becoming quite expensive with a lot of um, competition in the area, as I mentioned before, with uh, Jupiter and Tourmaline, the changes in uh, uh, savings and the price um, by a bigger company buying them out. And we see the Inception wells weren't that great. So 300-ish barrels per day, within a year declining to about 100 barrels per day. It's tough with these wells. When you have 2021 pricing and 2020 pricing, and even 2018 pricing, it's tough to get these wells going, increase production and really massively uh, grow your base to the point that you have the synergies required in the Montney. And here's the overall asset. So again, just the legacy wells, not the ones that uh, Spartan drilled, but just the legacy wells. You can see that uh, Spartan did buy it with, with a lot of flush production on it. 
So they bought it when production had gone up from about 500 barrels to 2,000 barrels in the, the space of about a year. So a lot of flush production here, gas, oil, not as great of a deal when you put it in that lens, uh, but still a lot of land here. And why was it a great deal? Because Spartan came in and they absolutely killed it. In 2022, they were drilling wells above a thousand barrels per day oil. So they went from 350 to a thousand plus. Think about the payback there um, and how much it's been shortened. And along with the fact that Spartan being bigger was able to drill these, I'm assuming a lot cheaper than Inception was. So really good. And multiple of these wells were drilled in the summer of 2022. Um, they came online in the summer of 2022. They were drilled in late 2021 or early 2022. Um, really nice asset, proved it out. And of course, it's now been sold uh, yet again. Okay, ARC, seven gens. Here is what they bought in purple. So the Kakwa flagship asset, I've spoken about this uh, many times in the past. They went from zero to 200,000 BOEs per day in just five years. But a relatively mature asset because of that. You can see how many drills have been done in Kakwa already compared to, for example, Gold Creek, which is where CPG now is, Crescent Point. We see the uh, Hammerhead acreage relatively open. We see Pipestone uh, as well. Uh, where are we here? So Pipestone in purple um, up here, sorry. So relatively undrilled, Kakwa is relatively more drilled, but still a phenomenal asset because of the higher liquids yields in Kakwa. So compared to the rest of the Montney, which is about 30, 35, 40% oil, the Kakwa had significantly higher rates of oil, which allowed it to grow a lot faster. Um, and also they had that very nice C5 condensate um, and they, they literally owned everything in the area. They owned the service providers. Everybody else had to compete. Seven gens had first rights uh, on just about everything. Uh, they were going to build a $50 million office in Grand Prix uh, just before they sold to ARC. And one cool thing about Seven Generations is all their engineers worked in the field. So 90 plus percent of their engineering team worked in Grand Prix, not in Calgary, in Grand Prix. So gave them a real good understanding. They could go out to the asset anytime. It was about 45 to an hour south uh, from Grand Prairie, Highway 43, I believe it is, and uh, go and meet the field operators. They could go and attend any of the events around town. Very active participant in the local community. Um, some people did not like them. Others did. Um, pretty typical for any oil company uh, that takes up a lot of resources uh, in any area. In town, they had brightly red colored trucks. All their trucks were uh, bright California red uh, with little seven gens logos on the side. So a big presence. They definitely wanted people to know they were in, uh, in the city and absolutely gorgeous country. So this is very, very close to where um, Modern had their stuff uh, in the Wapiti, but this here in the Kakwa was, was just absolutely amazing. Yeah, you had the river flowing, you had the beautiful fall colors, like just a great place to operate, lots of grizzly bears um, and, and very clean sites, given that seven gens grew from nothing. They didn't buy anything, they, they grew almost everything uh, organically. So they were able to build very, very clean sites. Um, the way that they, they had their system set up was on a load balancing system. So they had one major trunk line going through all their asset. They had super pads with up to 50, 60 wells per pad. And all the pads connected into the trunk line. The trunk line connected to five different compressor stations such that if one compressor needed some maintenance or went down, the other ones would take on the load and your production runtime was a lot higher than any of our older legacy assets you see um, in, in, let's say, the Deep Basin or further up in the Duvernay, uh, or sorry, south in the Duvernay. Um, and even what you see in some of the other Montney producers who didn't have the money to do that, this sort of thing, uh, whereas Seven Gens did. So big fan of this asset. Um, I interviewed at Seven Gens, which involved a field tour. 
So given that all the engineers worked in Grand Prairie, we, we flew out, well, I flew out to Grand Prairie, uh, met with all the people in the office, but also did a field tour and was just amazed by the forward thinking um, that happened. And Arc Resources really uh, got a jewel of an asset. Um, here, uh, we see what happened here. So seven gens uh, shareholders actually ended up owning 51% of the company because it came with, with a lot more liquids production uh, as we see here. So the year end production roughly same, but seven gens had 58% liquids, whereas ARC had 24% liquids. You can see why this Montney is so, so good. Uh, when you go from 35% liquids to 58% liquids, your entire growth profile changes and your entire cash flow profile changes. Uh, the combined entity, of course, became valued at 8.1 billion, uh, 1.16 million acres in the Montney, the biggest Montney company uh, by far at the time. And uh, even today, in terms of liquids, uh, liquids production for sure, uh, maybe not by um, gas production, although I'm, I'm not really following up on that um, these days. And uh, Arc Resources bought the seven gens for, for $2.7 billion uh, once again, adjust that for the uh, share price of ARC at the time to now, uh, if you so choose. Uh, but also keep in mind that ARC has bought back a lot of the 7Gen shares issued um, in that time frame. So um, they've done quite well on the on the repurchase of that uh, as time has gone on. And you can see a Montney giant with their multiple acreages uh, across Northeast BC. They have the Anti Creek, Older Montney, and then they have the Nest which is what the seven gens acreage was called, either Kakwa or the Nest, uh, Nest 123, along with the Deep Southwest. And they ended up buying seven gens at a really good time, given that the sustaining capital was coming down and the major infrastructure project capital was coming down. So as the company mitigated its decline rate, as the company had built out a lot of the infra uh, and the wells were getting better, um, Seven Gens was able to acquire it at a, at a really, really good time um, when essentially the excess money had been spent. And now it was all just about ha uh, half cycle uh, cash flow harvesting on the company's fantastic with lots of inventory depth as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Companies like Hammerhead that have a little bit higher liquids rating, uh, liquids weighting, for sure, it makes a big impact. Uh, 100%. And that should definitely be taken into account when you're trying to compare different companies. So when you're comparing X company, the Montney to Y company, keep in mind the liquids, the liquids weighting, just going from 35 to 45 is a huge difference in the, in the payback period uh, and huge difference in the capital efficiencies you're getting um, on, on, on these Montney wells. Also, ARC resources didn't have to take on any near-term debt. All the debt was spaced out, 2023, 2025. The uh, environmental liability rating was one of the highest in the industry at about 30, 30 plus. Uh, insane. The seven gens gas market sales, they had already done really good at this. Less than 5% going to ACO, 40% going to Chicago, and 24% going to the Gulf Coast. And about 18% going to uh, uh, Mullen, which is a really nice terminal because it sells into Washington State and into the West Coast, get some super good pricing on it. Um, and then Don, of course, as well um, on it. And the Montney stack. So we've talked about this before, how you can drill in the upper Montney, lower Montney, and the middle Montney. And you can see the economic uplift from the triple stack being done. Um, ironically, these Montney stacks have been the only place where it's actually worked. Uh, I haven't seen any good Permian example um, of the stack or the cube working, whereas this the seven gen Montney stack works exceptionally well, uh, which is why you see a lot of inventory depth here um, that's being uh, that Arc Resources got, despite the fact that it's a relatively mature acreage and it's one of the biggest. So you got to keep up 200,000 BOEs uh, of production you're gonna run through acreage a lot faster. So here we go, nest one, two, three. We have a Wapiti and then we have a deep Southwest. Uh, essentially the way that seven gens have 
put their acreage separate depending on the productivity of them. And one BCF per day of processing capacity. So one BCF per day, you want to build it today, it's going to cost you somewhere between $1.2 and $2 billion. You can see why infrastructure, uh, I'm, I'm quite excited to see when infrastructure cost actually comes back into the uh, prices of some of these entities, uh, given that so far, it's really not being reflected at all. And so when I say X company should trade at eight times free cash flow, well, maybe that free cash flow now needs to be adjusted. Uh, uh, the, the EV of the company needs to be adjusted to account for the fact uh, of the book value of actual assets they have. But right now I'm dreaming it's still quite a ways out uh, for that. And about 80,000 barrels per day of condensate stabilization capacity. So the condensate that comes out of this is very volatile. It's going to be bubbling and uh, giving off gas. And it's the kind of condensate that if you spill it on the ground, and you come back an hour later, you will not find it because it evaporates. It is that light of a of a barrel, uh, the the C5 plus Montney uh, type of condensate. So you need condensate stabilization, where it comes in, it simmers away, kind of like a boiling. The gas comes out, and then you have a cleaner condensate uh, that doesn't have a high vapor pressure or is suddenly gonna gonna bubble up as it gets hot. Uh, that's the last thing you want is an unstable condensate sitting in some sort of tank um, and then and then it gets hot for some reason uh, and then you get overpressure situations uh, which can happen and the seven gens corporate presentation was one of the best that i've seen on explaining why their acreage was really good you can see they're in the overpressured zone of the montney uh, this is more a geology map doesn't really tell me much because i don't know uh, much about this um, they were also in the thickest part of the Montney. And you can see here, the lower the temperature down hole, the higher the liquid's content. Uh, the individual that asked about hammerhead earlier, run, run the hammerhead acreage on this map and you'll see which ones have the higher liquid's content. Uh, it's relatively obvious uh, to do. So um, basically this area is where you want to be. And then this area is where you want to be. Um, and then you also want to be in the condensate range, not the NGL uh, production. Butanes and propanes are worth way less than Edmonton condensate. Um, so uh, for sure, any anybody in the Montney, just, just run your company's acreage on these three maps, and you'll kind of get an idea of the quality factor uh, of their acreage. Uh -huh. Okay, present point and shell. I just wanna see where we are here. So, oh yeah, we got quite a few here <laughs> yet to go. So uh, I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. Uh, we're about 40% of the way through yet. So, okay, so Crescent Point and Shell, a very interesting acquisition. This one, I, I remember vividly because I was on a plane from, um, from Grand Prix back to Calgary the acquisition was announced mid plane and I landed uh, and was extremely very happy about this transaction um, because of the valuation that was paid, not because I like Duvernay assets, but I liked Shell's uh, payment here or, or, or Crescent Point's acquisition price. And I believe Crescent Point jumped 15 or 20% the following day. So uh, I was validated uh, in my belief. Uh, we see here, they were buying an asset that for a long, long time had not really been drilled. Yeah, that's the kind of asset you want to buy because the decline rate is quite mitigated um, at this point in time. So $900 million, $700 million was a cash, $50 million was common shares uh, of CPG. Again, issued at about $4 a share. Keep that in mind. Um, the, the cash flow generation was really good. About 30,000 BOEs per day, 65% liquids, uh, mostly condensate, very little NGL, and uh, lots of inventory. So lots of inventory. Shell really didn't want to do anything here, wants to exit Canada. Uh, higher pressure, really good pay thickness here, and about 500 sections of land, 325 of which were undeveloped. So pretty nice. Um, working interest, pretty much 100%. Lots of locations, lots of infrastructure, 
lots of pipelines. And you see here over the 10 year development program, they only need 200 million of extra infrastructure spend. 20 million a year, basically nothing. Um, and Crescent Point was so good at this asset and they bought it for so cheap that by first quarter of 2023, end of 1Q, they had paid off the $900 million. So there you go. Uh, everything else from now on is complete gravy, complete excess cash. Shareholders are very happy. And I actually, I, I wasn't on Twitter when, when this acquisition was announced, uh, but I remember even at the time, like every acquisition that happens just has haters for no reason uh, because the haters want uh, more dividends. They want more uh, buybacks. They don't like any acquisition for the most part. Um, and, and you always get those comments that, oh, look at this, a junk asset, a high ARO, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't need to beat on that, but um, these acquisitions have done phenomenal. This, this is absolutely insane. To pay off a acquisition in two years and now to have 10 years of, 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 of inventory and you've made production go up by 20 to 30%. Yeah, that's that's kudos to Crescent Point on this. I don't give them kudos too much on, on, on many things, uh, but their technical team is certainly uh, top, absolutely top-notch. And here's where the Duvernay Shale is. Uh, to give it into kind of a geo, uh, geological map, uh, we see the Duvernay Shale on both sides. You have your Duke Reef complex in the middle. and we got the West Duvernay, K-Bob, and we got the East Duvernay, which is the, the place where Ardis uh, and, and some of the other uh, smaller companies are operating, Paramount. Um, also, Crescent Point also had some acreage there. Not sure if they still do. Um, and actually, production now is up to 45,000 BOEs a year, so up 50%. Uh, they've also added on about 150,000 acres and quite a bit of locations added with the delineation work they've done. Uh, with only 32 wells drilled. And you can see um, the K Bob Duvernay being compared to the Montney and the Eagleford. So, compared to the Montney, the nice thing about the Duvernay is it's overpressured. So, instead of 30, 35 MPA megapascals uh, of pressure, you, you get about 50 to 55 to 60 MPA uh, of pressure, which just leads to better uh, liquids recoveries out of your fracks. Um, so, very, very high liquids content in these Duvernay wells, also very high declines because it's a high pressure and you're fracking it. Uh, but, but very similar to the Eagleford in that sense. Uh, and as we can see here, the K-Bob Duvernay production by vintage. So we're talking about uh, MBOEs per day. So including oil and gas, we're at about 150,000 BOEs per day. That's it. So for all the talk that the K-Bob Duvernay gets, uh, we're at about 150,000 uh, BOEs, oil and gas. Think about how prolific the Permian is. So the Permian didn't just get, get good geology. They didn't just get good liquids yields, 80, 85, 90% oil in these wells, uh, at least right off the bat. But the aerial extent of the Permian is absolutely crazy. So this one goes out more to some of the investors with me that invested in 2014, 2015, that were part of that cycle. Uh, for all the pain that we feel and, and the hurt, um, the fact that the Permian was found and the aerial extent of it at 95%, 90, 95% liquids content, and the fact that cheap money pushed the overdevelopment of it, it was really a, an, an absolute needle in a haystack that was found. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much over it, not, not trying to make excuses, um, but our, our, our crown jewel, the K-Bob Duvernay, is barely 2% the size um, of the Permian in terms of liquids production. So just keep that in mind. Um, and the faster they rise, the harder they fall. So um, I'll leave that there. Um, here's, here's a bit of a map of the overall Duvernay. We can see the pressures change dramatically. So as we get deeper, the pressure goes up much higher and it's two times greater 
uh, it's it, it's more than two times the norm for this depth. So when I say overpressured, it's not just mildly overpressured. It is significantly overpressured. The thickness is a lot higher and the API gravity is a lot lower. So we're talking 60 API gravity uh, at this point, pretty much pure gasoline type of uh, uh, production coming out of this. Um, this reservoir and CPG has land kind of across it, but some of their lower lands are relatively less drilled than the main core uh, of the Duvernay where Aventive and Chevron and Shell used to operate these massive rigs. Uh, absolutely crazy. Uh, we we are drilling more than three kilometers underground, so two miles um, underground here, and we have the three different zones. So we got volatile oil, liquids rich gas, uh, EUR, and then your lean gas. So the more deeper you go, um, you do have the tendency to end up with more gassier zone uh, as well. Um, yeah, yeah, it it was an epic twenty four hours. Yeah. Yeah, Spartan Delta made those buys, uh, and then Shell bought that. And then the same day, uh, uh, Kiwitnock and Distinction bought the Aventive Duvernay. Um, that was that was a very interesting time, um, for sure. Yeah, especially to see transactions in the Duvernay two in one day. Like there's there's not that many operators in the Kbob Duvernay. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. So on top of this, what has Crescent Point done? Bought more lands. So they bought stuff from Repsol. And then they bought stuff from Paramount um, just, just recently, actually, uh, about 65,000 net acres. You can see consolidated their acreage a little bit more. And I think the Kbob Duvernay might get consolidated even more uh, here as time goes on. Uh, same, same as Montney. It just has to happen with more synergies. And the fact that we're at peak, uh, almost at peak technical efficiency at this point. Uh, so the companies that have that efficiency will not even mind buying producers that have a lower efficiency, uh, even if they have to pay up a little bit for that acreage. Uh, the average oil EUR, here you go, increased quite dramatically. Uh, EUR being ultimate recovery of oil on the wells, looking quite good. And you can see a little bit about what's changed. They've gone from 1200 meters to 3200 meters. They've gone from 11, uh, uh, 11 cubes per meter of fluid loading to 18, one ton per, per meter of sand to three tons. And the cluster spacing uh, has gone down almost three, three X the amount of clusters, a three and a half amount uh, of clusters per well, um, just tighter frac spacing. So not only has the lateral lengths increased, but the prop ends and the, and the amount of frac stages has gone up materially as well, which results in EUR going up 200% in the last decade. Landing zones have also changed. So instead of instead of landing at the top end of the zone, uh, CPG is landing at, in the middle to the lower end of the zone. Just natural geology. When you have a piece of land, the pressure in the upper portion, the shallower portion, will almost always be less than the pressure deeper. It's just pure science. The more overburden you have on a piece of uh, rock or or mud or shale, the more uh, the more pressured up it's going to be. So fracks have a tendency to to propagate upwards, meaning you should not be dr drilling in the middle of your zone. You should be drilling maybe sixty percent down into your zone. And uh, pretty surprising that Shell didn't didn't realize this earlier. Um, but anyway, that is what it is. There's some production results here of the well since entering the play. You can see the condensates uh, over time as well. Uh, you can see that the farming they did was further south. Therefore, the liquids yields are quite a bit lower. So 38% condi instead of 80, uh, 70 to 80% in some of their own acreage uh, further north. Uh, there's also 55% unutilized gas processing capacity through the basin, which is why uh, Crescent Point has been able to increase production relatively fast. Um, okay, kicking white cap and kicking horse. So white cap also bought kicking horse, $300 million deal, private backed by quantum energy partners. Uh, again, 34 and a half million white cap shares were issued, uh, about 8,000 BOEs per day. But this was a growth story. Kicking horse uh, asset was going to be increased uh, almost by 10,000 BOEs per day in just the next 12 months. 
and significant offsetting uh, offsetting activity. They got 90, 92 gross and 60 sections of Montney rights and average working interest of only 65%, providing the potential for further consolidation. So Whitecap's first entry into the Montney, uh, we see some acquisition metrics here. Um, I leave it to the people who are gonna be watching the recording to read this. Um, nothing too crazy in here, just a very detailed acquisition metrics um, chart. And we see here the kicking horse um, Montney rights and then the Cretaceous rights. So they got some of the Montney and then some other rights as well. And lots of uh, owned and operated pipelines along with a take or pay that was easily met with the current volumes. And actually you can see here um, some of the tier, the tiers that uh, they they put the wells into. So tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, four and five based on NGL yields. And um, always always try and get some sort of indication of this, especially when you have relatively undrilled acreage. Not all of it is going to be tier one. Um, always good to get some sort of map like this or look at offsetting acreage. Uh, analogous wells, adjacent wells, see how the acreage transitions uh, over uh, over its area. Um, yeah, you bet. Yeah, I should be on YouTube here later tonight. So uh, for sure, thanks for joining. Uh, Tamarack and Agata. So Tamarack's uh, big deal here. First big deal, Agata Oil Corp, uh, backed by... Um, uh, I'm losing the name here, but it's backed by the same company that's backed Spur and uh, run by Brandon Schwartz. Very, very uh, prolific oil oil man. Uh, run quite a few companies at this point. Uh, $494 million after the gore that was sold to Topaz. So Tamarack loves this sort of setup. Buy an asset, sell a gore right away, and you reduce your upfront cost. Um, and a few Tamarack shares created, 105 million, in fact at 234 a share um, and uh, paid for with their credit facilities. About 11,000 uh, to 12,000 BOEs of Charlie Lake production, uh, mostly liquids, 70 plus percent liquids. And they were gonna grow this over time and over 200 uh, net locations. I would bet this ends up being more than a thousand locations on this, uh, given that they got 300 sections here, uh, maybe even more drilling locations. And the Charlie Lake, I said this before, top two uh, by economics, well payout in North America. You have the Clearwater Martin Hills, and then you have the Charlie Lake um, up in this part of the world. And we can see some of uh, Tourmaline's drilling results as well here. IP, uh, IPs of over a thousand BOEs per day, mostly oil. Uh, IRR is in excess of 400%. Keep in mind that's half cycle. So it doesn't account for the price that was paid uh, up front for the land and whatnot, but those are absolutely crazy um, rates of return and very high productivity wells such that you can grow production very fast. The way I look at Charlie Lake, it's your, it's your Montney level productivity at half the price, much cheaper to DCET, uh, about half compared to the Montney and very nice asset with only 18 million of ARO. Super nice because um, it was a newer asset. Uh, that was there and got ownership in four gas plants, uh, nine multi-well batteries, lots of pipeline infrastructure, LLR liability rating of 18 and lots of drilling locations of very nice capital costs, 2.75 to $3 million, uh, sometimes up to three and a half million dollars per well with the newest uh, inflation we're having. And that gives you five, six, seven, 800 barrels per day of oil. Very, very nice. Uh, we can see the different areas of the Charlie Lake where Tamarack has uh, has acquired land, Pipestone, Wembley, uh, Valhalla, and Valhalla North. Uh, Tourmaline is more a little bit in the north part of this. Tamarack is more in the southern part, uh, which seems to be creating both equally really, really good wells. And uh, 40 API stacked light oil play, very nice porosities, very nice permeabilities. It's a shallower uh, zone, which is why uh, drilling it is a lot cheaper. And we can see Anagata's Lower Charlie Lake was 18 of the top 25 wells drilled. So very nice acreage. I continue to bang the drum 
on Tamarack um, just because I think this company is, is one of the most misunderstood companies out there in terms of a geological perspective. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the deals they've made or the share price. Just from the geo uh, geological perspective, they bought quite a lot of assets in a very early stage uh, of their profile, and it, they're still proving it out. And unfortunately, the price of oil has not allowed them to really grow like they need to or like they want to. So I think we'll see this play out over time. Um, but yeah, for, for all the emails I get about Tamarack, uh, I'm in no mood to sell this, this share um, at, at this point in time at, at these, uh, these kinds of metrics because a lot of what they've bought is very new. Uh, it's still very, very young. Um, it can be grown massively and the reserve auditors are not giving them the right um, credit for this, given that the plays are so new. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So there's a comment here um, by Rock Creek Freak. So a cool thing about the Anagata deal was Gain had a right of first refusal on Simon at Montney and they were able to uh, acquire that uh, Monty position for only $4 million. So nice. There you go. Um, always so much secondary information with these deals. And I think I said this before, uh, if I started talking about all of this, we would be here till a Tuesday or Wednesday morning. So uh, basically, and just overall, a high level review uh, for now. But yeah, thank you for that information. Um, so right after the uh, acquisition of uh, Shell by Crescent Point, there was Distinction Energy and Kiwitnock, which later, uh, which later ended up merging, bought these assets in the uh, Simonette uh, as well, and uh, in the Duvernay area to some extent, and uh, some Montney land, some Duvernay land, and some both. So one of the things to keep in mind is when your company acquires some land uh, or assets, Look at which rights came with it. You may not have all the Duvernay rights and you may not have all the Montney rights. It, it could be different, especially in an area like Simonette and Placid uh, where different companies own different zones. And the Montney is stacked on the Duvernay uh, in that part of the world. Very cool. Um, they, they eventually ended up buying uh, an asset that was flush production. So compared to what CPG bought off Shell, which was relatively low decline, um, he would not ended up buying something that had a lot of flush production on it, uh, yet they've still been able to uh, able to grow this quite quite massively. So, kudos to them as well. Here we can see some of the maps, uh, the latest updated maps with the uh, CPG and Distinction uh, Energy transaction. So you can see not not too many players here overall. Uh, PetroChina and XTO were later or XTO was later bought out. PetroChina remains, uh, and then Murphy has their acreage with with a. Uh, with Athabasca, which uh, curiously has ended up, uh, I believe, on some sort of sale website looking for farmings. So I'll have to check that, but I believe I saw that somewhere that they are open to even more farmings uh, on uh, on this acreage going forward. And a little map of the uh, different uh, processing plants and batteries as well. And I think this really the the slides here are are super geared towards people watching the replay because there's a lot of information that I'm not covering, but is in the graphs and the tables and the text. So uh, it's more catered towards that. Uh, I'm just talking about more of the high level main points here. Uh, we see some of the uh, wells that Kiwi not uh, bought. This is uh, uh, again, only the legacy wells. It doesn't include the new wells drilled, but you can see relatively uh, high decline rate on the gas here. Actually, this is only a one-year graph, so we can't see much, but we see uh, the gas rates are going up on some of the wells. Um, and then the liquids, again, we can't we can't tell. Um, I should clarify. This, this slide is actually all of Kiwi Knox production. And we can see the big ramp up that occurred in late 2022 um, with the gas rate. We can't tell by the oil rates because again, oil is more so uh, measured at the facility, not attributed back to the wellhead. And so we're really relying on gas rates to tell us uh, how the production is going up. And looks like they have about uh, 95,000 MMCF per day of production uh, of gas. So roughly 14,000 BOEs uh, being produced. 
Saturn Crescent Point, the first deal that Saturn made, the big deal. Uh, Oxbow assets, 6,700 BOEs per day, almost all liquids, 450 sections, and only 119 million. So very nice deal for, for buying uh, mostly oil. Of course, came with a lot of ARO and a uh, very low decline rate, 12% decline rate, um, along with 500 reactivations and optimizations. This is what was perfect for a company like Saturn. Um, they ended up doing a lot of these reactivations and some new drilling as well on these lands. Uh, however, um, a lot of work to be done on the abandonments as well, uh, but they got it super cheap. So uh, they were able to do about 3,500 barrels uh, per day of workover potential and very, very good uh, capital efficiencies on the workovers. So Crescent Point, it was just not a big deal for Crescent Point. Uh, there were some interesting things that CPG was doing. They were putting used tubing in the wells. Uh, they were also not paying some of the vendors. Uh, there was a lot of interesting things happening with this asset, and it just ended up in likely better hands here um, with, with Saturn. And uh, keep in mind, 268 million warrants were issued with this deal that later, actually just last month, have expired worthless. So... Uh, pretty interesting that the dilution was created, but then the dilution's impact was removed uh, because the company kept doing more and more and more deals um, going forward. Um, here are some of the graphs. Again, I'll leave this for people in the in the uh, recording to watch. It looks at some of the uh, wells in the area. So Southeast Saskatchewan is very uh, fragmented. It's very heterogeneous, but at the same time, there's a lot of nice land still with a lot of upside. Um, because the pools are so small, nobody has drilled every single place in the area. So there is more and more pools uh, that keep getting delineated. Some really nice pools over 200 barrels per day IP, some up to 300 barrels per day IP. Um, hedging summary, Saturn ended up going into some really poor hedges that uh, affected them all throughout 2022. But now they are in a better spot and they still own the asset. Um, so in hindsight, um, now that they're through that rocky patch, things are okay, but they still suffered massively. Uh, they essentially got $58 for, for their WTI barrels uh, in 2022, when WTI averaged $98 barrel US. So about a $55 uh, a Canadian dollar difference in the realized pricing versus the hedged pricing. And almost all their barrels in 2022 were hedged off this transaction. ARO, $220 million. Uh, estimated undiscounted, you discounted you discounted at ten percent, you get forty one million. The biggest mistake people make looking at ARO is looking at the undiscounted today's value. We're not going and abandoning all the wells today. These wells will produce for five, ten, twenty, forty years. So discounting all of the ARO is not the right way to look at it either, but going at it and looking at it undiscounted, is not the right way either. The fine balance, you're gonna to have to look at the asset, what sort of wells are on the asset, what is the lower economic limit on the asset, what is the late stage decline rates on the asset, and then make a interpretation as to where you see ARO going. Um, and once again, I will highlight this point, because they have so much ARO is the reason they have so much work over potential. So every well counts as ARO. If it can be reactivated, great. You get more cash flow out of a well that essentially is showing up as a zero asset. So um, I do I do like these deals um, that get completely trashed because of the asset requirement obligations. But when you look into it, there's five, six, 700 wells to optimize uh, at very, very nice capital efficiencies. Um, and Saturn has done exactly that. Tourmaline, Black Swan. So Tourmaline also bought, after they bought Jupiter and Modern, they bought Black Swan, $1.1 billion Canadian, um, about 50 to 60,000 BOEs per day of straight gas uh, for the most part, uh, 1,600 Montney locations. This is just what they're saying. Uh, and 230,000 of Montney rights, acres. Uh, nice, nice EURs on these wells, 8 to 10 BCF and very strong um, liquids yields as well, but not C5+. plus. Uh, yes, you have the C5+, plus, but there is a lot of the uh, NGL as well. So the NGL yield is a lot higher than our traditional Montney because this is way up north. 
uh, Northeast BC. A nice little map that they've put out. So you can see the different compressors in the area, the different pipelines, uh, a little bit about the processing complex and the uh, working interest in the gas plants and then the production. So they bought it at 50,000, increased it to 60,000 in one year. So very nice. Uh, big pads as well. Uh, you can uh, again see that modular design on the gas plant here. So the main pipeline runs straight and then you keep adding, adding units or modules uh, as you grow it. Um, you can see the amount of undeveloped area. So the main development was in the southern part of the Aitken, but the rest of the acreage remains relatively undrilled. And you can see where it is on the entire map of acquisitions. Very nice map put out by uh, Kalima Energy. You can see CNRL Pony Pony, you can see Tourmaline Polar Star, Black Swan, um, Chinook, Conoco Kelt, Arc 7 Gens, and uh, the to Tourmaline also bought some land from Pony Pony as well. So the entire map here, uh, all in one. Surge and Astra Oil. So Surge bought about 4,100 BOEs, 90% plus liquids uh, for about $160 million. Again, a lot of it was, was uh, with shares. So adjust that if you want. And very nice netbacks, $42 per BOE netback at 65 WTI. This transaction was made in 2021. When you run a $95 average for 2022, you end up with Canadian dollar netbacks of upwards of $75 to $80 a barrel. 4,000 barrels, $80 a barrel, and uh, 365 days uh, equals about $100 million. So they paid off $100 million of, of this just in 2022, paid $160 million for it. I remember this deal getting so much hate when it happened about uh, Surge is going to keep buying and acquiring and doing this and doing that. And they did, yes, but the deals were well worth it and more than supportive. Um, I would say that this transaction is getting very close at this point to uh, payback of the $160 million um, from this. So operating net back is, is, is not just uh, free cash. So we do have to put in capital to keep production flat, yes, but as far as paying off the, uh, the, the, the barrels bought, with the operating net back, we're getting close in terms of paying it off with free cash flow. I still think we're we're a little ways off, maybe fifty to sixty percent payback um, at this point in time. Very nice liability rating here as well, five point four, very low ARO. And uh, let's go back in time for a brief second once again. This is April twenty seventh, twenty fourteen, I believe, twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen. A news release. Canadian intermediate producer Torque Oil and Gas is buying light oil assets from Surge Energy in the Canadian Bakken of Southeast Saskatchewan and Manitoba for $430 million Canadian. The assets have about 4,750, uh, 4,750 barrels of oil equivalent per day. So assets in just about the same area sold for more than two and a half times the price. Roughly two and a half times the price in 2014. I think this is 2014 or 2015. So now Surge bought this, the very similar assets back for 160 million. I'll take it. And uh, especially when a lot of it has been paid off already uh, over the last two years. So not, not every deal is a bad deal. If a company is spending money to acquire and grow, looking at everything as a, as a, as a, taking away from your dividend or, or buyback uh, may not be the right strategy because there's some fantastic deals happening. Uh, here's the same on a map. So the different, the different assets they bought. Uh, of note is the Pinto and the Steelman. Uh, Steelman for its Frobisher wells that are right here. Steelman and Lampman uh, are right next to each other, side by side. Viewfield is more of your Bakken play. And then Menard is gonna be your, your, your Bakken uh, and also your Mydale, Alida, other kinds of beds uh, in that area, along with some production in Manitoba as well. So here's some of the Frobisher wells that came off of Astra Oils land, upwards of 350 barrels per day for your IP30. These wells only cost 700 to 800 thousand dollars, maybe a million now, uh, 
given the uh, cost inflation. Payouts in 45 to 60 days at $80 WTI. Does it decline very fast? Sure. But you get your payback in 45 to 60 days. You get a second payout within six months, six to eight months. And then you get a third payout over the life of the well. Increased production, very nice and very high torque, obviously. If oil prices go to $100 a barrel, you're seeing that exceptional return profile, maybe three-week payouts, three to four-week payouts on your DCET cost. Journey and Brico. So just uh, very briefly here, um, Journey bought these few assets from Brico. Um, they paid $6.6 .6 million for about 650 BOEs or so, $10,000 a flowing barrel. These tiny bolt-on acquisitions have, ha have done quite well. So even though they don't really show up as big deals, uh, they've allowed companies like Journey to continue to expand their production and their acreage. And then the assets are there for expansion in a higher oil price environment. Uh, here's the production on these assets. Uh, we can see relatively low decline. So very low decline on the oil. The gas is declining a little bit more, but, but the oil overall, relatively low decline. These are the assets that uh, companies like to buy. Uh, smaller companies, because they don't have to keep putting cash flow in to keep production flat. Once they buy it, they just use it as a cash harvesting uh, until they need to drill a well multiple years down the road. I3 Synovus. So I3 bought 8,400 BOEs, half liquids uh, from Synovus, $54 million. Lots of uh, NPV here. Uh, keep in mind, NPVs or PDP reserves, any reserves already include ARO. So when we say the PDP reserve is $200 million and the ARO was $300 million, let's say, on, on a very, very old asset, the actual PDP value net removing the, uh, the, um, the ARO part of it is actually $500 million. So NPV tens already include ARO. I might be preaching to the choir here. I may not be. So... Uh, anyone that talks about PDP uh, is great, but then there's the, there's so much ARO. What are you talking about? It it already includes uh, the undiscounted uh, ARO obligations, which we discussed earlier. Looking at it as an undiscounted value may not be the right way because we're not abandoning every well today. Uh, it's just not the right way to look at it. If banks and investors choose to look at it that way, so be it. I'm not going to change their mind. I'm just gonna invest in companies where I see that mismatch and let it play out over time. Um, 80 reactivation opportunities, again, with, with lots of ARO comes reactivations and the uh, assets complement the existing I3 assets uh, as well in the area. A little map here, central Alberta, uh, you can see in the yellow is the different uh, assets that were bought in the deep basin. And you can see the, the land base is, is huge. Lots of potential. A lot of it has already been drilled, but still lots of optimization and production increase opportunities. Here's the same thing in a little bit more detail. So we can see zoomed in some open areas. You can see the I3 acreage in orange and the Sonovus acreage in yellow uh, mingled together here to come up with uh, they, they essentially uh, bought acreage in where they already had acreage and only a 7% decline on this asset. Amazing. Synovus was not going to go and capitalize this. It's a good thing they sold it. Is it is it the best asset out there? No. Does it have the most drilling locations and the most optimizations? Likely not. Uh, but when you're buying something uh, for less than PDP value after accounting for ARO and less than two times net operating, uh, net operating income, it's hard to go wrong with a, a small junior company. Um, along with the fact that this was bought in July of 2021. So when they say they bought it at less than two times net operating income, you can see how the operating income would have been much higher in 2022. So they got this excess boost of uh, of, of cash flow and income uh, for that year, given that the asset only has a 7% decline. Definitely, these assets should end up in companies with scattered assets. Like somebody who already has a concentrated area buying this makes no sense. It only makes sense for I3 and Cardinal uh, and Bonavista and Saturn to buy these sorts of things. 
um, because they already have scattered assets with a higher OPEX and they can in fact get synergies that reduce the OPEX uh, going forward. Uh, here are some of the wells in, in this area. We can see uh, I3 bought it and they've in the meantime increased production from this asset. So they've gone from about 2,200 barrels per day to about 2,500 barrels per day oil. And then on the gas side, even more because it's deep basin, a lot of gas. They've gone from about 45 uh, MMCF per day to about 65 MMCF per day. So about a, they've taken the 8,000 BOE acquisition. They're now at about 11,000 plus BOEs out of the asset. Very nice. Here is the same asset on a 60 year history. Just showing you this asset used to produce over a BCF of gas that they have. Am I saying it's gonna produce a BCF of gas again? No, but these sorts of very, very old legacy uh, assets in the hands of the right operator can come in and have a second resurgence as older wells are refracted, are optimized, are brought back online, and um, really lots of potential still. But it takes love and care and TLC, which bigger companies just don't want to put that amount of time when they got hundreds of thousands of barrels they can increase in other parts of the world or, or in their oil sands assets relatively more easier. Okay, uh, I think we'll take about a five minute break here. Um, I am exactly 60% here through, um, somewhere between 60% uh, through this. So we'll just pause here for uh, five minutes and let's uh, restart at uh, five minutes past the hour and uh, we'll go from there. A quick reminder to anybody on the Twitter space, um, if you do want to join us for part two uh, on the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca, you scroll to the bottom under events, and um, you can join us there uh, for the Zoom, uh, starting at five minutes past the hour. And I'll see everybody here uh, shortly.
Okay, well, we are back. And, uh, I think we got about 20 or so um, transactions yet to go. I think I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, but the the really the vast majority of the deals happened in uh, 2020 and then the first three quarters-ish of 2021. Since then, we've actually not, not really had all that many deals. Um, so maybe uh, this uh, little bounce in pricing and a little bit higher stability uh, will bring more of that. But um, yeah, I think we will uh, continue on on the same uh, path we were on. So uh, July 2021, uh, Certus, a private company, they bought Sitka. Um, Sitka is a ARK financial back company. So once again, more evidence that the previously biggest uh, Canadian oil and gas PE firm was looking to exit um, the the business. And this deal is kind of interesting uh, as I will go here uh, for a particular reason. So uh, Certus bought these in July of 2021, uh, about 5,000 BOEs per day was added. They never gave us a purchase price, but we can see here the uh, two P reserve value, 363 million, uh, one P reserve, 140 million. And, um, they merged with the existing Certus entity. So whatever it was, about 5,000 BOEs per day. And then they added this uh, 5,000. Um, with that came a new uh, entrant into the market with Anvil Channel Energy Solutions come in, a $65 million senior secured loan facility to Certus Oil and Gas uh, for those that own rock resources. Anvil Channel Energy was the same one that provided financing uh, to Rock Resources on their transaction. So definitely seeing more new entrants come into the market with the lack of traditional capital uh, available. So, so this was pretty interesting on this news as well. And uh, then we saw just last uh, June, uh, yeah, last June, I had a private placement opportunity pop up on my desk. And I was, I was looking at it and uh, 9,500 BOEs of low decline uh, production, deep basin, uh, lots of acreage, lots of midstream and $170 million for the 10,000 BOEs per day, um, a little growth profile diagram. And it was Certus Oil and Gas. Yeah, half of which was the Sitka production. So essentially it would be, it would be very, uh, uh, cool or curious to know what did Certus pay for Sitka and then what do these uh, assets eventually end up transacting at? This private placement never closed. They weren't able to raise the money in, this was June 2022 when it first came out and I received it in August 2022 um, and there was just not enough interest. And that's, that's really what got me pretty bullish um, at the time because I was thinking, wow, even in August of 2022 or July, uh, there's not enough interest to do private placements for uh, about $80 million because um, $110 million of it was debt. So $80 million of equity, $110 of debt. And there was these, these transactions were just not closing. They kept showing up, repeating uh, in my email from different people, um, different brokers and whatnot. So a um, few different things here. I guess n not really not really any assets that I'm sharing. I'm just sharing the story that A, the uh, assets were having difficulty transacting even in the peak of the, uh, call it 2022. And then also the fact that companies took, took, these, uh, took this production and then had it on the market less than a year later. And uh, essentially they were willing to sell it for a price that didn't really reflect the 2022 uh, kinds of metrics uh, that we were looking for uh, on our on our companies. So um, maybe this might end up in one of I3 or Saturn or somebody's hands here um, because it's similar deep basin stuff uh, all over the place. So July 2021, we had Spartan uh, Delta now acquired Velvet. So Spartan on its acquisition spree now got the big kahuna. So $743 million dollars and very clean asset, Gold Creek, Carr, and Pouce Coupe, uh, 20,000 BOEs per day, uh, brought Spartan up from that 45,000 BOEs to about 65, 70,000. Uh, 
an extremely undeveloped acreage, uh, almost brand new. Uh, when I was working at Velvet, this was 20, July 2017, we were producing the first well out of the uh, Gold Creek area. So basically less than five years of development and that too in a junior undercapitalized company. So Velvet didn't really have the money to go and drill massively. Uh, they in fact had to go and sell their well sites, um, their, their little batteries um, in order to fund the further drilling uh, on their lands. So basically very, very undercapitalized land. Um, Velvet of course being the one that bought Iron Bridge slash RMP as well. This was a 2018 uh, hostile takeover of sorts, um, which was a very interesting exercise to be a part of uh, as an investor in Iron Bridge, I should say. And uh, yeah, lots of locations here. Liability rating of 27, which makes sense because it was a brand new uh, acreage and 1.2 billion of estimated tax pool. So I think Spartan Delta got one hell of a deal once again here. Um, just, just knowing the Velvet acreage and how productive it was and uh, the extent of it, I think a pretty good deal here. And this acreage, of course, now belongs to Crescent Point. So it was flipped in about 20, 20 to 24 months. It was flipped uh, along with the other Montney that uh, Spartan Delta sold into Crescent Point. Um, yeah, so uh, here we can see uh, the Gold Creek land. So, so Velvet is in blue. You have Spartan Delta in red, so not, not really contiguous, but at the same time, these two Monty acreages are just fantastic. Carr and Gold Creek, uh, both really, really good, especially Gold Creek more to the eastern side. Um, even Gold Creek West is pretty good, but but this, this stuff to the eastern side uh, was really good. And a lot of it, um, well, not a lot of it, but they, they had those sections in the natural fracture zone, which uh, for those who have been following me for, for about a year, uh, Velvet owned some lands where the Montney upper, lower, and middle uh, are are naturally fractured between between the three of them. So you get this benefits from very low decline rates, despite it being an unconventional well. So uh, sometimes you just find a little juicy sweet spot and uh, uh, really use that to increase your production up front, uh, and then also sell it with a lot of uh, inventory on top of that. So. Uh, really, really nice uh, acreage. And look at this. The majority of the Velvet Gold Creek lands were approved under Alberta's Emerging Resource Program. So under which the, the, the 42 existing wells and also 34 more wells would qualify for only a 5% crown royalty until the benefits expired in 2029. So what better way to grow an acreage than to have your first 76 wells only paying a 5% royalty for many, many, many years. So um, some of these things, you can't put a value on it, uh, but maybe you can, right? Like you go, you take your 76 wells, you take a QM production out of them for until 2029, you run the 5% royalty versus the original royalty, and you can get a hard value dollar amount for it. Uh, but as far as like, what is it worth to Spartan or Crescent Point? It's really hard to put a value uh, on that in the transaction. But I like these little supplementary things that come with deals uh, because they show you that there's more being bought than just barrels or or just land or just reserves. Um, here's one of the natural fracture wells. So you can see it was making about 500 barrels per day in July, 2018. And as we got to July, 2021, it was still making about 50, to 60 barrels per day or 50 to 60 cubes. So about 300 barrels per day low natural decline because it's it, it's in that naturally fractured uh, area. Uh, Velvet was first uh, first founded in June of 2011. So about a 10 year portfolio company uh, of actually out of New York. So Warburg Pincus, Trilantic Capital and Zam Ventures. So no Canadian member, uh, as far as I'm aware, was, was part of this. Uh, it was all New York based. And then they put another $100 million in uh, after the fact, I believe 2013 or 2014, maybe. Uh, and the development plan was supported by 30 million of geoscience data. Um, this could mean fluff, but having worked at Velvet, uh, this is definitely true. The 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 geoscience and the geology team there was absolutely top-notch. 
uh, individuals who would give presentations at uh, CSPG and other different uh, um, geology and geoscience-based conferences. And they put a lot of work into modeling and looking at the different kinds of uh, ways to develop this acreage. So really, really fantastic uh, deal there. And I've got a little um, Twitter status here. I'm not going to click on it, but but if somebody who's watching the recording or watching it live wants to go to that, that status, uh, I post a little 15 second clip of when I used to be on site at Gold Creek. And it shows you the amount of trucks we had rolling in, oil trucks. Uh, these wells were absolutely fantastic, uh, making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of barrels of condensate uh, every single day and really came on super strong. Uh, we we had to flow them through a sand separator and put an incredible choke on it to control the flow uh, of these wells. And um, interestingly enough, we the chokes were tungsten carbide uh, $15,000, some chokes that, that were special ordered and within 24 hours, they were washed out. So this well was making so much oil and, and, uh, and gas and sand back from the formation. Uh, it was just a sight to see. And, uh, that video is, is pretty interesting. Not, not just because of the oil trucks on site, um, and the, and the regularity of them, but because horizon 48 drilling, uh, is, is drilling in the back. So, um, you know, new, a, absolute new acreage, the first Gold Creek well drilled, uh, the first battery put up, and uh, a eight-kilometer road built in from the forestry trunk road. Amazing gravel uh, for the trucks to roll in and out. And uh, I guess for those looking for a little sneak peek or a, or a small video of an active drilling site that's also producing and trying to delineate a new acreage, um, cool little clip there. Westlake and Boulder. So Westlake bought Boulder Energy, Brazo area, uh, Drayton Valley, for those that are in, in Alberta around there. Um, it is a belly river formation. So a stack, again, multiple channels uh, on top of each other. Very low um, development in this so far. And Boulder, again, was a ARC financial company. Uh, very, very undercapitalized. Um, about 140,000 of acres and 2,500 BOEs of oil production. Uh, original oil in place, 777 million barrels. Nice. And less than 3% recovery factor to date. Uh, lots of drilling locations and also enhanced oil recovery potential. Uh, low production decline, uh, decline, nice oil, 44 API. You don't really want to get too much lighter than that. So uh, nice oil right there. Uh, and on top of that, this asset was flipped. So just last uh, last week, actually, uh, Highwood Asset Management uh, bought Boulder Energy for $98 million. We, we don't know what Westlake paid for Boulder, um, but they essentially felt good enough to flip it for $98 million um, and kind of go from there. And here is what was bought. So quite a few sections, a bit of horizontal development going on, a bit of older uh, vertical development as well. You can see the stack here, so the different zones. Um, and then tax pool also came with the deal, 290 million of tax pool, including 80 million of NCL. So immediately deductible tax pool. And here is the uh, well that might make or break them. So the 12 of nine, this is a multi-leg open hole, multilateral, uh, paid back in eight months, but you can see the consistent profile on it. It's made uh, over 150,000 barrels to date. And um, if this if this pans out, uh, they might have quite a few open hole multilateral uh, drilling locations here to uh, to drill here as time goes on. So it's very interesting that Westlake sold it, given that Westlake drills a lot of these multilaterals in the Manville. Uh, it does create a question in my mind as to why they would sell it, um, given that they're experts at it. But maybe there's something here that they needed money for something or um, the investors are trying to get out or uh, whatever the reason may be. Uh, either way, this this multilateral, I'm going to be tracking very closely any other multilaterals uh, in the area because the lands are quite big. Um, and, and some of these gas plants actually are, 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 uh, are uh, quite new and underdeveloped. So the Drayton Valley area was um, supposed to be the big gas gas zone, lots of this development, and then 
it it just fell flat. So some of these plants are brand new. Uh, Kira Zeta Creek, for example, is a, a state of the art um, new gas plant and uh, lots of extra compression, huge compressors uh, in this, everything automated and uh, everything is graveled right, right to the nines. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of excess capacity for, for the right company who wants to go and uh, either increase gas or oil production. Um, not much gas is going to be coming out of this zone, but we can see here only about uh, 15 BOEs of gas for um, 250 of oil. So not much, but either way, I um, just want to point that out that that there is there is a lot of potential in this area. Um, did, did tours of these gas plants uh, when I used to work in Crane Valley. So uh, pretty familiar with, with the big enthusiasm for the area and then the subsequent uh, complete collapse of activity uh, with the Montney and everything else coming into play, uh, other cardium areas and whatnot. Surge and Far Sky. So Surge is second deal here. They bought Far Sky for $58 million, all shares. Uh, only 3 million of it was um, assumption of net debt. So about $5 a share roughly. And 1,500 BOE per day of 95% liquids, uh, more than 95% liquids and amazing operating net backs. Again, this sort of asset in a $95 oil environment uh, was net backing more than $80, $85 Canadian a barrel. Uh, Fire Sky had a very nice LLR as well, 3.5, low uh, decommissioning liability, very concentrated asset and uh, awesome wells, absolutely awesome wells. 500 barrel per day Frobisher wells uh, coming out of this. Uh, these, are, these would pay back in, again, like four to six weeks at $80 WTI, um, probably less than three weeks at $100 WTI and still producing um, about, uh, where are we now? So about a year down the road, still producing about 100 barrel, uh, barrels per day. So with the net bags, you're getting quite a good good little purchase. Um, they, they, they did buy this with a bit of flush production. So this is again, just a legacy wells and they bought it somewhere around here. Uh, with with this big flush that Fire Sky had after the drawdown from 2020, um, but at the same time, at least they didn't buy it right at the peak here. They bought it when it was at its historical average of production and got a really good deal on it. So um, not not really complaining. Uh, the the other thing I will say here, I I don't know if I should say this, but uh, essentially I had a meeting with the uh, CEO of Fire Sky uh, after the fact, uh, probably six months ago. And uh, he was not happy that the deal was made. So that always tells me that uh, the buyer got the, the better end of the deal. Uh, but essentially, the PE in Fire Sky wanted to get out. And uh, after they spent so long delineating all these nice Frobisher pools, and um, once again, never got to take advantage of it. So it's really bizarre how PE private equity firms have acted in the last 24 months. Um, they've, they've left a lot of value on the table at just the time that they needed to just be patient for two more years. Uh, after being patient for five, seven, 10 years, they lost control when, when the timing was best. Hindsight is always 2020. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's a reality. So, and reality can be blunt sometimes. Uh, okay, Obsidian and Peace River Oil. So uh, Peace River Oil Partnership, I should say. So um, th this is a very interesting, um, area. Why? Because in November of 2021, um, Obsidian bought out the rest of the 45% that they didn't own in PROP for $45 million, roughly. So about a million dollars per percent. Just two years before that, Highwood Oil was going to buy 55%, the, the Obsidian's share for $97 million. So it was worth about 2x as much uh, in 2019 as it was in 2021. But let's go back a little bit further. When the Chinese company that Obsidian bought out in 2021 first entered this project, that would have been 2010, June 2010, the value of this project was $1.8 billion. So the Chinese company paid, 45, uh, paid $850 million for the 45% stake. And now that entire stake based on Obsidian's price that they bought it back from is $100 million. Something doesn't quite add up 
So uh, essentially, the it's it's no doubt that the China Investment Corporation paid a extremely uh, egregiously overpriced amount uh, to get into the name and into the partnership, um, but also they wanted to get out so bad that Obsidian was able to buy it back for a lot cheaper. Um, at this point in time, here is the PROP. We can see the different lands that are drilled, and then we can see all the undrilled areas still, and almost completely undeveloped. Uh, here is the wells per section. We can see about three to four wells, multilaterals per section uh, that we're getting. Here is the PROP a prop uh, production. So it went up in 2016 to about 10,000 barrels per day from about 4,000 in 2014, then declined all the way back to 4,000 in 2022. And then Obsidian brought it back up to 6,000 uh, in the last year. So it's got the potential. It's got the ability to ramp very fast. It's got the exploration potential. It just needs hard prices. So it's it's a bit of a more expensive part of the blue sky clear water. Um, so it does need a bit higher prices, but they've got the land. They've got that completely open land and they can explore it. They can develop it very, very fast. Uh, here's kind of your typical well, 200 barrels per day. Uh, in about three years, it's down to about 50 barrels per day. Quite good. Uh, it's not it's not a gangbuster by any means, uh, but but these sorts of wells are still relatively quite good. Nice paybacks on them. And you can the nice thing is you can increase production very fast. Because they don't decline like a Montney well, they, they have a shallower decline rate on them. You can increase production from these areas uh, very fast, batch drilling. Um, here's another one. This one came on at 350, 375 barrels per day and 2015. So it was definitely drilling good wells. It's not like in 2019, suddenly the market, like uh, the, the entire geology didn't work out. The geology was working out. There was good wells. Uh, it's just the... The, the the valuation on high capex uh, heavy oil at the time was just not good. Uh, we all know the WCS differential blowout in 2018. So the value was not being recognized. And then uh, Obsidian stole it for a song in 2021 um, back from the uh, Chinese Investment Corporation. So a nice acreage, uh, another well, 2022 came on at over 400 barrels per day, blue sky uh, zone. And then here is the one, the really, really strong well. So this well has ended up in the top list in Alberta many, many, many months in a row. It's produced over 220,000 220, barrels in roughly 18 months. So 220,000 barrels, roughly $50 net back, $11 million of value in 18 months. So they need to find more of these wells. Uh, they need to find more wells making over 400 barrels per day. But the $1.8 billion valuation uh, was somewhat validated uh, by some of these wells that have come online. So can they find more? We'll see. But uh, if you can buy out your partner for cheap and you have the optionality in, uh, into the future to grow, uh, go and increase our production, develop, explore, it's just as good as having clear water rights. Um, these days with the multilateral open hole uh, potential. CNRL and Storm. So CNRL bought Storm in late 2021, about $960 million public company, uh, only a 10% premium. Uh, they got about uh, 130 million standard cubic feet per day of gas, 5,600 barrels of liquids and uh, nice sections. They have again, consolidated the area outside of Black Swan. So surprising that Tourmaline didn't buy Saturn or a Storm. They definitely had the money for it, um, but didn't end up doing so. And CNRL came in, souped it up. And now you have this kind of two-pronged ownership here. Tourmaline owns 50% of Saguaro. Uh, you've got Tourmaline here. You've got CNRL all over the place around it. You've got Conoco and then Patronus. Um, and then and you've got CNRL's um, Penny Pony acreage as well here on the Western side. So it's become a two prong fight. Uh, neither of them could really take out the other. Uh, maybe in the future, one buys the one buys the other's acreage in this part of the world. Don't know, uh, but again, so much undeveloped upside and 960 million for uh, roughly 25-ish thousand BOEs per day. So 
they they definitely the valuations on gas definitely started going up um over the last couple of years 2020 versus 2021 um I, again i'm going to leave this one for the uh, for the people watching the recording uh, but you can see the well results that validate the potential of the acreage and i'm a big fan of maps like this if if you're a producer with any kind of acreage you put out maps like this you've just saved me multiple hours of trying to go out and look for adjacent wells and their well results and what kind of frack it was and whatnot. Really appreciate uh, any kind of uh, company that's going out and putting these kinds of maps together with the MMCF per day and the IP365s on it. They also got a bit of production in Horn River Basin. Uh, Horn River Bas uh, Basin, previously a darling of the Canadian gas patch, I'll say. Uh, very, very nice, very high gas rates coming out of this Spectra Energy was quite active up there, 2010, 2011, 2012. And then when the Montney multi-stage fracking was discovered, the Horn River just pff, completely went to zero because there's cheaper gas in the Montney than the Horn River. But CNRL got some acreage here anyway, and there's a ton of gas in that area. A little bit higher cost supply, but it's still there. So uh, I think Canada might be the best country in the world uh, for for increasing natural gas production um, as, as in we can do it very, very fast if the infrastructure and the takeaway capacity was there. And that really is a joke. So uh, yeah, um, if, if we get there, I think I've been hearing about LNG Canada since like it's been 14 or 15 years. I don't even know how long it's been. Like before I started my engineering for sure, they said, uh, yeah, LNG Canada, we're going to become the big, big boom, uh, this and that. And we still don't have an active uh, LNG export terminal. Really embarrassing. Uh, Tamarack then ended up buying Crestwind in December of 2021, $184 million. A few more shares were issued, $26 million uh, to be exact. 4,500 BOEs per day. Nice, nice little price. Uh, about 40000 flowing. Seems to be where a lot of these oil-weighted transactions I've traded at on a per flowing uh, metric and lots of drilling locations, uh, some of which was undeveloped, some of which was uh, already had reserves associated with it and consolidated Tamarack's Southern Clearwater. So the Jarvie um, area and Newbrook, Tamarack already had land there and it essentially consolidated it together, uh, minimal ARO and new uh, infrastructure still being built, gas processing, oil pipelines, oil batteries, water floods, uh, et cetera. Um, and essentially that ended up getting Tamarack to its pre-Delta Stream acreage, which was a lot, 593 sections already they had. And here is a bit of a map. So we have headwater in blue. Uh, this is their core acreage. This is their Western acreage that I've discussed. Here's Tamarack, they bought this from Highwood. Tamarack, what they bought from Woodcote as well. And then Tamarack, what they bought from Crestwind is down here in this blue color. And then Tamarack Delta Stream. You can see why I'm so excited about this, this acreage, this Delta Stream acreage, given the headwater growth and the well results in their small Martin Hills core acreage and what Spur has done uh, overall in the Martin Hills area. Um, but this Crestwind acquisition was mostly in the Southern Jarvie and Newbrook uh, area. And you can see a little bit of a map. So green was the joint land, orange is Crestwind, and the, the yellow was the previously Tamarack land and some nice little wells here. So 200-ish BOEs per day or, or BOPD. Uh, I don't think it's a bad well. Anybody expecting 500, 700 barrels out of these Clearwater wells? Uh, those only exist in certain places, the Baytex Peavine and the CNRL Smith. That's really the only place you'll see those. Uh, these wells are absolutely fantastic um, economics on them. 250 barrels, 200 barrels, 150 barrels, uh, really good paybacks on them. And especially if they can be water flooded. So there's a water flood pilot going on here uh, in the Southeast. Here are all the wells on a uh, type curve graph. And here are some of your wells. So 200 barrels per day peak rate, 120 barrels per day peak rate, 
180, 200, 115. So you add these up, you get about 150 barrel per day average rate. That's pretty good. That's, it's pretty good for drilling something for 1.3, $1.4 million, especially if it has a shallower decline on it, it will pay back within three to four months, um, 80, 85 WTI. Um, here is a well uh, further to the uh, west here. So more in your, uh, no, further to the east. So more in your Minook area, not, not in the main uh, uh, main area here. And again, 180 barrels per day. So looking pretty good. Here is your some of your wells. Um, we can see it's still a very, very early stage. They're still figuring out the different well lengths, the different ladder lengths on the uh, on each of the individual legs. And then we're also looking at the different injector patterns. There's your water flood pilot. Uh, I can say for sure the Jarvie pilot so far has not panned out. So we'll talk about Tamarack Delta Stream in a sec. We'll see why Tamarack Nipissi uh, clear water has worked out on the water flood. This Jarvi so far has not worked out, but the injector was drilled in 2017. So an older style injector, not really the right pattern. There's only one injector leg, uh, whereas uh, some of the newer patterns are using a trident pattern uh, with multiple injectors in the same well, uh, spaced out between the different production um, legs. So lots of upside here. They just are focused on Martin Hills and Nipissey. This thing, we'll leave it for now. We'll come back. Is is kind of their mentality uh, on Jarvi and Newbrook. Uh, Strathcona Sonovis. So Sonovis uh, said Strathcona would buy the Tucker Oil Sands project. The Tucker Oil Sands came from the Husky deal previously discussed in uh, mid 2020, and 800 million dollars. So 800 million dollars for about 20,000 barrels of oil per day, 40,000 flowing. We we keep coming back to this 40,000 of flowing. Uh, metric on these oil oil properties. And Strathcona got even bigger with the buy of this about 130, 135,000 barrels per day. So again, the PE model of funding different new codes, not working. The PE roll-up model is working. And about 18 to 21,000 barrels per day, but looks like some trouble on the horizon here as well, uh, similar to the other uh, oil sands projects we've been seeing that uh, similar to Lindbergh that we saw earlier, the production has fallen from 20,000 down into the 18s and now into the 17,800 range. And the steam oil ratio has for the first time hit 5X. So Strathcona Resources buying uh, a lot of tier two, tier three, tier four oil sand SAGD assets, nothing wrong with it. If you can get it cheap with long reserve life, but you do not want to see productivity degrade to this fashion. So whatever's happening here, we'll keep tracking it still early, uh, but but definitely one to track going forward. If this thing continues to degrade, it adds to operating costs. And if you only have X amount of productive capacity um, at, at your processing facilities, the higher your steam oil ratio goes, the less barrels of oil you will produce because you only have so much volumetric space for your oil and your water together to be processed. So uh, it works the opposite in, 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 in uh, companies like Meg Energy, which are seeing reduced steam oil ratio uh, and, and ConocoPhillips Sermont, where you're seeing reduced steam oil ratio, your same facility can handle more barrels um, because it's a volumetric um, limit. It's not an oil limit uh, on the processing. And right after that $800 million acquisition, Strathcona went out and bought Caltex. So Caltex, a polymer flood uh, manual channel development company, uh, Saskatchewan, mostly Saskatchewan, 13,000 BOEs per day, 98% oil. Very nice. Uh, right next to Strathcona's Lloydminster heavy oil EOR. Of course, that came from Kona. So Kona um, merged with Strath Resources. They become Strathcona. And then Strathcona became the vehicle that kept amalgamating uh, the future companies. And uh, further to this, oh, they were only at 110,000, I should say, not 135 uh, after these two deals and a 48 year reserve life index. Because they're buying all these long life, low decline assets, this is really a consolidation of smaller oil sands projects and, and heavy oil. Uh, EOR operations, which mostly polymer flood 
uh, in the case of Caltex. And they've got their three main areas, the Coal Lake Thermal Oil, the Montney Gas in Ground Birch, and then your Lloyd Minster Heavy Oil uh, as well. 13% base decline and Waters Energy Fund is doing really well. They've paid off a lot of their debt. They they had the capital support to come in when they needed to come in. Uh, Adam Waters also made an exceptional decision by selling oil stocks when he saw the crash coming uh, in, in, in 2014, 2015. So he was already quite well cashed up and uh, now got the support. And now they're just buying up all these, uh, call it secondary-ish assets and uh, producing them, making tons of money off this heavy oil. Uh, nice little um, place where the name came from, Caltex, Calgary, Texas. We can see the president and co-founder of Caltex also founded Caltex Energy and had his studies at Texas A&M, Calgary, Texas, Caltex. Uh, here's some of the wells that uh, are, are in this. So pretty high water cuts because it's a enhanced oil recovery. You're having polymer, you're having water flood, uh, very high water cuts, but they can deal with it. And the wells just flat. The oil is absolutely, uh, this is what you want when you're buying something in an up cycle, which, the Waters Energy Fund and Strathcona are a cycle investors. Uh, I believe they are going to be IPOing shortly here. Uh, if not IPOing, then taking over a RTO of a currently existing public company and going public that way. Uh, but the model, really, really good. Uh, and they've been able to execute multi-billion dollar transactions back to back to back. Um, here's some of the other information. So this is Strathcona's Cactus Lake asset. This came from Kona, a world-class polymer flood. It really proved it out. And then you have a Bodo pool along with the um, Caltex's East Bodo pool, which is their flagship asset. And I will just put this out there. This asset was first started by Pengrove. Remember, um, Strathcona bought Pengrove in 2020. So it all came full circle here. And this is a 2011 annual report by Pengrove. Uh, it talks about the Palmer flood could recover 20% of OIP incremental oil. That means after what's already been produced under primary or underwater flood. 20% of original oil in place, incremental oil can be recovered. These are multi hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in the ground. All the information is here. This is a a very, very extensive report. If you're looking to download it, just, just look this up or look up the um, report here itself and just read it, read what it says. And uh, it has graphs, it has tables, it has calculations, it has formulas, it has maps, it has everything you need to understand this Palmer flood pilot. And uh, I just laugh. I just laugh every time because um, I've got portfolio companies that are trying out Polymer that are trying out new enhanced oil recovery uh, at very, very low recovery factors in their pools. And uh, there's these people who say, oh, this will never work. You know, this is just a tiny company uh, trying to market to investors. Well, maybe Google a little bit and read about uh, adjacent fields that are already working with Polymer that companies are paying multi-billions of dollars to buy. Maybe you wouldn't look as stupid making uh, dumb comments like that. Uh, Vermilion Lacrata. So probably the most polarizing uh, acquisition in the last 12 months, 12 to 18 months. So $477 million acquisition. Vermilion bought Lacrata, Lacrata being a public company uh, in the MICA area, Northeast BC, some in Alberta, uh, 77,000 net acres. So as we know, uh, Silicanth Energy kept a lot of the Alberta acreage and uh, Northeast BC, uh, acreage went to Vermillion in this deal, uh, 13,000 BOEs per day when they bought it, a goal to grow it to 28,000 uh, in the next couple of years. Not quite there yet, so still working on it. And uh, essentially, Vermillion wanted a deal, and they got a deal. Um, when, it, when the deal was first announced, there was a lot of uh, polarized comments. When we got to June and July, there was a lot of uh, victory lapping by the Bulls, uh, the Vermilion Bulls, that they got a really good deal. Uh, and right now, 
maybe the jury now is back in session because we don't know. We don't know two things. We don't know what kind of growth rates and productivity Vermilion can get. And we don't know what type of commodity price environment that those growth rates and that production will be created in or, or, or produced in. So there's a lot of uh, unknown still. This will be one that maybe three to five years down the road, we can go and say whether it was a good deal or not. Um, I'm of the opinion, obviously, that that Montney acreage will continue to get more expensive, especially liquids rich Montney acreage. Uh, CPG and Spartan Delta is our latest little, um, um, it tells us what the pricing is at the moment, our, our current valuation metrics, um, relatively cheap, I think still, Spartan Delta sold it for cheaper than it should have. I'll discuss later as to why I think they did that. Uh, but essentially, um, this is the price right now, and we'll see how they grow it over time. Here are some of the wells pretty much undeveloped acreage. They've got a couple of plants, oil batteries and whatnot, but it's it's essentially completely open. Uh, some of the newer wells uh, or, or older wells, quite good. 800 barrels per day oil, but a sharp decline on it down to 200, 200 250 barrels per day. And then it continues on at that. At that point, the decline is tapered off um, a lot already. Here's some of the newer wells. 800 plus barrels per day and still got a pretty heavy decline on it. So the IP looks good, but the IP 180 not looking that great. So lots of gas. So it's not a problem with the gas rates. It seems like more so just the way the well is being fracked or the prop end being used. Uh, we're having some significant declines on here. We'll see if they can fix it over time. Uh, still early yet. Again, it's it's very hard to go and grade a Montney acreage just because slight differences can go and change up the entire profile. So if a different fracking technique is used, uh, you use bo a ball drop, sliding sleeve, you use a different kind of prop end, you go and drill more uh, longer laterals, you can do more stages, different kind of prop end intensity, different kind of prop end placement. It makes a huge difference, I think. The prime example of this is B32 Exploration. Uh, for anybody that's curious, go to B-32 Exploration and uh, look up their corporate presentation and the mistake that was made on their first uh, few wells, first two wells, versus what high tech Energy right next to them did, and they got much better results. And what did they do? They had a few changes on the drilling and completions, but essentially high tech once they drilled the well and they completed the well, they just left it. They didn't produce it for six months and that let the water imbibe into the pores. It, it, it put the water, it kicked out the oil and voila, you had wells that were three to five times as good as the B32 wells. Something as simple as that, that you wouldn't even think of. It, it sounds like a science project. Uh, like, oh, let's just, uh, once we frack the well, we'll just leave it for six months and see what happens. Um, so definitely early yet. On the, on the technological uh, improvements in some of these areas. Some areas are, are relatively well uh, delineated like um, Arc Resources Car, like um, Hammerheads Montney, like C um, Crescent Points Gold Creek. I think those are pretty well delineated at this point as to the best way to do it. This acreage, relatively new. La Crata never had the money to go and drill tens and 20 of wells and find the best way. So Vermillion strictly bought it for acreage purposes. And April, 2022, now the market's really heating up. We're seeing 80, 90, $100 oil and Tamarack buys rolling hills. So um, $46 million in cash plus 9.3 million common shares of Tamarack. They now have 100% of the Southern Clearwater. So they bought Crestwind to get to 95%. Now they bought rolling hills to get 100% about 2,100 uh, barrels per day, nice operating net back on it. Uh, and some projects that were being done, gas, uh, gas, conversa uh, gas conservation, oil pipelines, a little bit of infrastructure and uh, oil handling capabilities. They got 54 net sections here and pretty much no ARO. Very nice. Low sustaining capital, 
of course, given that the, the clear water wells are doing relatively good. And this now has consolidated them to try out another Jarvi water flood pilot. I don't see any major activity quite yet, but they now have all this area. The wells are coming on pretty strong. Now, if they can get water flood to work, then they have three water flooding areas, Nipissey, Barn Hills, and Jarvi slash Perryvale. Now we're talking about reserves, bookings that go exponential as the years go by. And along with the Charlie Lake as well, which is relatively underdeveloped given it was in Anagata, which uh, pretty aggressive growth company, but not, not super aggressive uh, given the mandate of, of, uh, of a brand shorts to go and, and not sell companies at the top, sell companies so that the acquirer can still make a lot of money. Um, I forget if it was him or Neil, Neil Rosell that said that, but either way, the, the, the point still applies. And a little bit more of a map. So you got blue is your Tamarack, and then uh, you've got your uh, acquisition in this teal color. And decent wells on this acreage as well. 120 barrels per day, 100 barrels per day. Not, not the greatest clear water wells, um, but again, it's it's early. Not that much money has been spent in Jarvie and Perryvale um, and Newbrook compared to Martin Hills and Nipissey, which have that prolific uh, net pay. Here's a newer one, so 200 plus barrels per day. So heterogeneity is, is definitely a concern in the clear water, but when you do hit wells like this, you know you can hit more. Um, and again, let's just remember, there's, there's still changes being made to lateral lengths, uh, the spacing between lengths, the different kind of pumps that are being used, um, and the, the amount of legs that are being used. So still early yet, but um, I like seeing 200 barrel per day clear water wells. Yeah, I like the 150s too, but as soon as you hit 200, you know you've got a very juicy uh, land package there. And then we're at the top, June, 2022. Uh, we have Saturn making another acquisition from Crescent Point and 260 million this time for about 4,000 BOEs per day. So way more expensive than their uh, earlier Crescent Point acquisition, but that's because it's Viking. So 98% light oil, you've got the Viking with lots of extra uh, um, land and inventory depth and a I'll talk about this as I go as well, but the, the um, yeah, I'll talk about it on their next asset, uh, but, but also the land around the uh, Bakken where Cash Island and Crescent Point are drilling the uh, multilateral wells. So we'll talk about that shortly, but yeah, 140 sections of land and payouts, uh, seven months. And we see here, the market definitely got, um, interested because we're we're now talking about payouts at $95 WTI. So, okay, nothing wrong with it. I actually like seeing companies that are more aggressive rather than the ones that sit there um, not, not responding to the current oil price uh, or the trajectory anyways. And uh, yeah, a nice growth asset along with their other Saskatchewan stuff. And the royalty rate came down because the Viking has relatively low royalties. Uh, lower operating cost because it's in Saturn's existing area and facility util utilization again only at 60%. So always look for how how full are the facilities in the assets that are being bought. If they're underutilized, you have a very good chance of increasing production and uh, getting operating synergies and increase, increasing production without infrastructure spend. And Saturn continues to have a great success with its Viking program. They they talk about the wells they've drilled. Um, the Viking is more of a batch drilling program. You'll get eight good wells. You'll get one really good well. You'll get one dud well. That's just the way the Viking works because of the shaley zones that exist uh, between the upper Viking, the lower Viking, and just even within the Viking net pay. Um, you got to batch drill these things to hit type curve. You can't drill one or two wells and expect you might hit the bad one, you might hit the really good one. Uh, doesn't mean that that's your, your new type curve. Um, so, and then they're also talking about going up to 1.5 miles on the lateral. Not sure about this. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, certain companies have had success thus far 
uh, Baytex and uh, Whitecap and as well as Obsidian on the longer laterals in the Viking. Synovus BP. So Synovus bought the rest of the Sunrise. They got 50% from Husky. They bought the, the other 50% from BP, $600 million. Uh, they also have a variable payment that they're paying $600 million. The variable payment terms are exactly the same as what they gave Conoco when they bought Conoco's project, uh, except that was five years. This is only two years. Uh, along with Synovus also offloaded their 35% position in the Beidou Nord, east coast of Canada. So um, that's essentially the, the price. Again, the effective date was one month less. So 45 days before, and this resulted in the final purchase price being only 394 million. So you can see the upfront purchase price came down almost a third, more than a third, 35% because of the effective date. So for sure, keep that in mind uh, when you're looking at some of these transactions. Uh, very good deal that Sonova got. They essentially bought 25,000 barrels per day for 600 million. It might end up being seven, eight, 800 million. Uh, by the time you look at the closing adjustment and then the uh, impact of the variable payment on top of that. So much lower than the 40,000 flowing we've been referencing. Uh, and they, they think they can increase the production to 60,000 uh, after multi-year development. So we'll see. So far, nope, not there. So production has fallen from that 50,000 last June to about 43 to 45,000 today. Steam oil ratio, not bad. It's not, it's not really super degrading, uh, but still going up from the twos that it was in uh, last summer. And on top of that, a 50 year two peer reserve life and favorable royalty rates because it's pre payout for another seven to eight years. So exceptional economics on it and the longevity to boot. Uh, yeah, and the one final thing, Equinor just delayed the Beidou Nord project for three years over rising cost. So BP got a 35% interest, literally means nothing because Equinor is the operator and gets to decide when it goes through and they just delayed it for three years. So I think Synovus here made a pretty fantastic deal. This is, this is quite good, especially to do it in June of 2022. Yeah. Whitecap XTO, another one in June of 2022, $1.9 billion. Once you adjust for the positive working capital, $1.7 billion, uh, 32,000 BOEs, a lot of gas here. It's very NGL and condensate focused. Not a big fan of that part of it, but the, acre, the acreage itself is tremendous. 672,000 gross acres, 639,000 net acres, and it operated 165 MMCF per day plant. Um, so looking pretty good there. It, it has Montney and Duvernay, um, both pretty good. Uh, Kakwa area, definitely gas focused acreage. Not looking so good right now, <laughs> just given the price of gas, uh, but they have the optionality for decades to come. So they can just leave it, they can fill it, or they can just keep it flat or grow anyway, and then see what happens. Um, with with gas pricing going forward, uh, with the with the um, commissioning of LNG Canada here, hopefully in the very near future, and this again brought Whitecap into the big boys league. So now post XTO, we have gone from sixty thousand barrels per day, sixty thousand BOEs per day to about one hundred seventy five thousand BOEs per day. So a complete three X in the company size. They have also become the biggest along with CPG in their little class. Um, I wouldn't say little class, they're in their class of more than mid caps. Now they're going towards bigger caps. Um, and per million shares outstanding, the average production went up significantly because they paid with it for uh, paid for it with all cash. So a stark difference to their earlier deals that were mostly share deals. They said, okay, we're going to come in, pay for this all cash, take on some debt. June 2022, of course, getting people a bit more amped up uh, to take on some debt. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, it just is. And yeah, this is a little, the, the acreage so far, concentrated development, but they got something like 500 to 700 sections uh, of this. The Duvernay stuff is not, not that interesting. The Montney stuff could go on forever. 
uh, very close to where the modern route plant was and where uh, Tourmaline bought that acreage from, from uh, Jupiter and modern. One well, about five MMCF per day. So we're talking 750 B, uh, BOEs of gas. Not that great, but again, we can't we can't see the oil rate here. So uh, very unfortunate thing with Alberta, the way they put production back to the facility instead of to the wellhead. Uh, we lose out on a lot of granularity and Whitecap doesn't seem to want to provide the same level of transparency that Crescent Point is providing on their Duvernay drills. So maybe that'll change. Uh, maybe it won't. We'll see. Lots of acreage. That's all I can say here. There, there's a ton of acreage here to both grow production and keep it flat for many, many, many years, gas focused. But I think that that all depends on on where the company sees gas uh, going forward. Um, keep in mind, white cap is now only about 65% liquids. So I get this, I get this comment a lot that that yeah, white cap's an oil company. Whereas uh, something like a Arc Resources is a gas company, you would be surprised how close they are, both in terms of liquids percentage, but also how close they are in operating net back per BOE. They are very close, despite one being seen as a gas company and one being seen as an oil company. More maps here. So this is our Montney. This is the Duvernay, mostly drilled up, not not that interested in this asset. I think this should just be sold uh, to somebody like a CPG or a Paramount or a, not Paramount, um, PetroChina or Chevron. Uh, this can be kept because of the extensive acreage that's in this area and the pipelines and the gas processing along with the condensate. Uh, again, utilization on plants, very low. Good to see for further growth uh, for the company. And we see the uh, lots, lots of inventory here. This, this I truly believe uh, some companies will just make up nonsense about, about tier one and inventory, but this is very close to the Jupiter and modern acreage, extremely underdeveloped. And the wells just came on like monsters, no matter where you drilled. We had so many areas, Lynx, Cutpick, Route, Car, uh, Car, Kakwa, all the wells were good. Very high productivity wells. So um, looking pretty good on, on, on that standpoint, but I want to let this play out for a little bit before making any big conclusions here. Um, they definitely paid a lot for the per BOE basis, especially since a lot of it is gas, but they essentially paid for land and definitely needs two, three, four years to see what they do with it. Do they really increase production? Can they take advantage of a higher gas pricing environment? Do they now just have an optionality on oil CapEx versus gas CapEx? Uh, is that worth anything? So um, yeah, we'll see. Journey and Enterplus, these Enterplus assets were being marketed for a long, long time. They've been wanting to exit. And we can see here, uh, they sold half of their production to Journey, half of it to Surge, which we'll discuss later. Here's the Journey part of it. 3,400 BOEs, 60% oil, 140 million, pretty good deal. Uh, not, not definitely not a cheap deal, but relatively fair for 60% crude oil um, right now. And in fact, they are getting 4,400 BOEs um, because of the way the royalties uh, have been shown here. Enterplus likes to do this. They like, they like to show production after royalties. Doesn't really make sense to me, but uh, who am I to tell them what to do? So uh, lots of water floods here, lots of secondary recovery and lots of even tertiary recovery. So uh, polymer floods and gas floods, uh, all all kinds of things, lots of 3D seismic data, a ton of wells. Um, so we'll see what Journey does with this as time goes on, um, but obviously big fan of water floods and uh, polymer floods. So um, we have the Anti Creek water flood and then the Medicine Hat is, is more of a solvent. Uh, I, I believe it's a solvent flood, if I'm not mistaken. And we can see these. So uh, this is your Southern Alberta uh, Medicine Hat pool. 8% decline on it. Um, overall recovery factor, only 14%. So lots of oil yet to recover uh, from this pool. Um, here is our anti-creek water flood. Small acreage, but sub 5% decline at this point. It just keeps producing. And it's only at a 5% recovery factor. So they put on water flood relatively early and 
now because they put it relatively early, they can keep producing it with, with very little new production um, polymer. Okay, yeah. So the medicine hat is also a polymer flood. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, so I think we got about five or seven to go here. So uh, we'll just power our way through and get them done. So uh, I guess I can do a quick, quick uh, a uh, reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that wants to join us for the final few uh, visuals here, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, and uh, you, you can join us for the visuals. Uh, if not, the audio will continue on. I'm likely going to have no Q&A session today, just given we've been going on for quite a while. Uh, maybe take a few questions, but um, yeah, I think I'm I'm definitely planning to present next week as well. So I'll make it uh, make that the Q&A uh, possibly. So Strathcona Serafina, here we go. Strathcona is back at it. And uh, they are, they, they bought Serafina in August, uh, 2.3 billion, 40,000 uh, BOE, mostly oil, pretty much all oil. So now we're seeing the transaction costs go up. It's now gone to 60,000 a flowing barrel. And um, Pinebrook and uh, Pinebrook Partners and Camcor were looking to sell out of Serafina, more private equity exiting the Canadian oil patch. It, it just is what it is. Bad for new supply, good for anybody investing in a bullish uh, oil and gas macro structural supply outlook, uh, structural undersupply outlook. So pre-transaction, post-transaction, a lot, lot of the wells uh, are in this Saskatoon area. So we can see the, the different uh, heavy oil. Uh, I believe these, these were steam floods um, that Serafina had. So Miota, uh, Edam, and a couple other ones. And uh, all of it very concentrated. We can see huge original oil in place here per section, like absolutely crazy. And that's why they're able to produce tens of thousands of barrels with just a few wells and small facilities. Overall, a very, very tight knit operation. Uh, we can see it got up to 40,000 uh, barrels per day when, when the asset was bought here in Q3. Uh, this again, only covers legacy wells. So any new wells that were drilled don't show up here, uh, but pretty good, not bad, not bad decline rate on the on even the legacy wells, uh, given they're being supported by the uh, EOR here uh, taking place. And that took Strathcona to about 160, 150 to 160,000 barrels per day, uh, BOEs per day, mostly oil. So at this point, I'm thinking if they IPO, that's going to be close to a seven to ten billion dollar IPO. So we're looking at some some the big scale that's been built uh, over the last three and a half ish years uh, by that team. So should be very interesting uh, how they end up doing this, whether it's IPO or RTO or or, or maybe the rumor just continues <laughs> and they just stay private uh, for now. So some big transactions now. We're seeing a two point three billion dollar. We're seeing a one point seven billion dollar, and then now we got a one point four billion dollar. Uh, transaction Tamarack buys Delta Stream, another very polarizing uh, transaction. They sold a gore on it, and um, one point uh, it ended up being 1.425 billion after the gore was sold um, to Topaz. 23,000 BOEs per day was going to be the growth from about 19.5 right now uh, when the deal was made, and they basically took everything out that Delta Stream had. Um, so lots of assets and ended up with 750 net sections. So they added about 160 net sections to what they already had and mostly Nipissey and some in Martin Hills. Um, Martin Hills, of course, being the core, they got the core Martin Hills with the thicker net pay as shown on the uh, headwater map earlier and nice purchase price. Again, we're up to that 60,000 per flowing barrel because we're adding some land as well here. And um, some of it came through with a deferred payment. Some of it was straight cash. Some was common shares. Uh, but the water floods have worked out really well in Nipissey and in Martin Hills um, thus far. So we'll see this play out over time. It is not fair to, ju to ju uh, judge this transaction right now. I know it, it happened at a slight top in the market. Um, maybe a, a, a early cycle top, you can say. Uh, but there's so much assets, so much oil in the ground here, really needs time to prove itself out, both in production reserves and enhanced oil recovery. We were basically just started water flood 
uh, in Nipissee and Martin Hills, let alone any sort of polymer or uh, other tertiary recoveries uh, with, with millions of barrels of oil per section, probably 30 to 50 million barrels of oil per section in the ground. A uh, bit of a closer map here. So see Tamarack already had this. This is where they were focusing their work on. And then we see the Nipissee asset uh, along with the Delta Stream down here. And then a uh, another project in Canal, which not entirely familiar uh, with it right now. We'll see it developed over time. And the big thing with the Martin Hills Clearwater pays out multiple times. So the Permian is going to pay out twice in 36 months. The Martin Hills is going to pay out five times in 36 months and pay out almost three times in 18 months. The Permian pays out once in the first six months. And then you have this long tail on it um, because of the higher decline rates. And yeah, the uh, work on the Jarvie and Perryville continues on. And yeah, I think this is the graph to keep in mind when you're looking at clear water. The, the first payout is not that much different than the Permian. It's your second and third and fourth payout where you're making that money back constantly over time um, that really pays off. And this is non-water flood. Now you add a water flood to it and this thing, this thing could go even, even flatter to this extent like this. Um, and here's your proof in the pudding. So the Tamarack Nipissi EOR. So here is a primary well that's not underwater flood. Kept declining to 200. Here's a well underwater flood. Is at 400 barrels per day flat for almost 18 months. Here is your three layer um, pattern in Martin Hills. Here's your Nipissey pattern, the Trident pattern. Uh, they had the tunic fork method, and then now they're onto the Trident pattern. So three uh, oil producers, one leg of injector, three oil legs, one injector leg. Here you got a different type going on with more injectors and more produce um, and more producers on top of them because the pay is so thick that you can produce upwards and laterally. Whereas here, the pay is only five to eight meters. We're trying to produce more laterally. Spur also has one a, a water flood in Martin Hills. Um, I want to wait to see Tamarack do one before I take this as the as the go to. So following closely, uh, but so far Spur has the longest history on a water flood and you can see how the production not just came back, it, it came back, it keeps rising and it stays there. Reserve auditors will never give you credit for this, never. You gotta go and prove it year after year after year after year and you'll get one more years or two more years um, of credit on that as time goes on. Um, and we verified this. We verified the well, the Nipissey well. Don't just take corporate presentations for what they say. Verify it on softwares like Petro Ninja. Here is another well that they drilled. Um, looking quite good so far. 250, 300 barrels per day. Anything over 200, I really like. So 275 is absolutely golden. Um, Topaz Delta Stream. This is just Topaz's version of the presentation. They got a 5% overriding royalty for 263, uh, 265 million. Amounts to roughly 1,500 barrels per day. Um, so they paid they paid up for it, but on a acreage that can both be increased in production and have enhanced oil recovery. Pretty good bet to make here, especially backing a company like Tamarack, which now has the foothold uh, in that area. And yeah, I'm just talking about different productions that, that were generated. Um, as, as the company grows, they're going to get more production from this 5% um, going forward. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The reserve, the reserve evaluation is quite wonky for sure. Um, I mean, Tamarack's reserves make no sense at all. So I, I wouldn't use those as, as accurate. And yeah, it does throw off NAVs uh, and even NPV 10. So um, I don't use reserves as gospel. There's, there's uses to them and then there's limitations to them, uh, major limitations to them. Surge Enterplus, so the other part of the Enterplus disposition, 
uh, we have about 4,000 uh, BOEs per day here being bought, 99% light and medium oil. So Journey bought 60% uh, liquids. The part that Surge bought was 99% oil and about 10 years of 2P reserve on it. Again, water flood, 2P reserve means almost nothing. Um, but it is nice that they have that that 10 year um, kind of like across the industry norm number. Three different pools, Southeast Sask, Giltage, Cadogan, very low decline rates on each. And um, we're back up to that 50, 55,000 per flowing barrel mark. So e even though this was in late 2022, we were still there. However, the net purchase price, again, has been driven down because the uh, the working date for the transaction was uh, earlier than when it was announced. And I've ran through this before in my surge update, so I'm not going to go through it in in that much detail. Uh, but essentially, they're saying 10 years of extra reserve uh, is 15 million BOE of 2P. And you run a water flood from 14% recovery factor to 24% recovery factor, you have an extra 40 million of reserve based on adjacent pools. That's actually 27 years of reserve. Uh, if you want to hear my whole spiel on this, uh, please check out the surge update that I did. It was around November, around right after this acquisition. Uh, I talked about all the three pools that they acquired. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much, uh, but essentially they have this Enterplus Cadogan uh, pool, which is relatively flat. You have the Gilt Edge pool, which is some, some nice wells here. Um, some wells that have died off a little bit as the water injection moves. Uh, the overall guilt hedge is relatively flat. Um, and I talked about all of this in much more detail uh, in that surge presentation. So I'll leave it uh, for that. Um, some Bakken rights here as well. There's some good information on the Freda Lake Radcliffe unit. Um, and then the, the overall production, you can see how it got increased. So with the increase of water flooding, the production went from 1,000 barrels per day to almost 5,000 barrels per day in two years. This is what enhanced oil recovery can do. And I repeat the point once again, companies are waiting to do enhanced oil recovery projects till they see sustained higher pricing. Look for companies that have the right assets to do so. They, they will benefit greatly um, from expanding their inventory organically without drilling, just enhanced oil recovery. Um, here is the, uh, the, the production overall on, on the... Um, on the Ratcliffe unit, I believe this is, uh, yeah, the, the, you can see nothing. Enterplus did absolutely nothing here. No drills after 2015. They just let the thing decline. And now Surge was able to buy it at this valuation, not at this valuation, just 10 years ago. The oil is still there. The recovery factor is still very low. The production is not being optimized. It's just been letting, letting to be declined. And again, I refer back to your well count that I started off the presentation with, when the well counts are going down, that's telling you that wells that went down have not been worked over. They have just been left as is, and they are reactivation potentials uh, and re-optimization potentials as time goes on. Um, talked about all of this, and here is the um, pool in Alberta. So this is the gilt edge uh, I believe this is the gilt hatch pool. We can see they drilled two new wells here and they've got production back up massively. So as much as Surge is waiting to develop some of the other assets that they bought in this deal, they did develop this asset. I believe it's the gilt hatch pool. And you can see how production is at a five-year high. And, and it doesn't take very much, just two wells. And see them, you can't even see them there, but... Um, can increase production very, very fast when you have pools like this with low recovery factors. Saturn, Ridgeback, the transformative acquisition for Ridgeback, uh, $525 million, um, 20 or 17,000 BOEs per day. And here are some of the metrics for people on the recording to see. Uh, here's the map. So we got, uh, in, in this case, actually Ridgeback is in blue and Saturn is in yellow. So a lot of assets acquired. And this comment being made here, 850 million in tax pools, plus a strong technical team. Do not underestimate the importance 
of taking on individuals in acquisitions. I go on LinkedIn and I snoop around sometimes. I'll see, okay, Surge bought Enterplus. Did any Enterplus engineers or geologists come across with the deal? Well, if they did, well, then they know the assets. They know what the asset is doing. They know it way more inside out than somebody who is looking at it from the outside. And even if they're there on a contract for a few months, it's good to have some movement, lateral movement uh, between companies when that's happening because they know the assets. You can never get as much outside information as you can when you live and breathe the asset. Uh, you've got daily production, your operators are calling you, they are telling you different things, they want different optimizations done. It, it definitely breeds a uh, level of competence with that specific asset. A um, couple more here. So with this asset, they got this Bakken, the conventional Bakken on the outside. And why is the conventional Bakken on the outside interesting? Because that's where Cash Island and uh, CPG are drilling these multi-legs in the Bakken. Really, really good results. And the reason for these good results is in the outskirts of the Bakken, the zone is a little bit thinner. And when you frack the Bakken, the fracks were going into a water zone and they were communicating, creating a lot of water production, which made the wells uneconomic. Now that you can go into it with a multi-leg, multilateral open hole, you no longer have that problem. And the wells are a lot cheaper. So something to watch for if you're a Saturn investor, um, there's definitely upside looming here <laughs> because of other adjacent wells as we see right here. We see Saturn land in yellow, and we see the five or six multilaterals um, that are non-Saturn on the side. The land is literally intermingled around it. Uh, pretty good place to be. Here are some of other the other assets um, that they got from Ridgeback. So lots of open land, lots of uh, pools yet to develop and delineate, and lots of older production to optimize. Not Not so much for drilling locations, um, as we see on this map as well, but infill drilling, uh, lowering the spacing and going out and doing some exploratory drilling along with the multilateral upside. Um, so there is still upside and they got it for so cheap. Like they bought this for 30,000 of flowing, really good with the tax pools as well. And uh, again, I'll leave this for the people on the recording to read, but essentially it's talking about how the multilateral are cheaper than even a frack well. Uh, it talks about the um, why they go into the Bakken now on the outskirts. Um, it's talking about the history of Ridgeback, which was Lightstream Resources. Many uh, oil and gas investors from 2012 to 2016 are groaning right now uh, because of the absolute mess that Lightstream was. Went from $10 a share to bankrupt in two years, maybe two years. Um, if that, uh, and, and, and the same assets got put into Ridgeback after they wiped out the shareholders and even a couple of the debt holders got wiped out. Uh, it's a really interesting story. There was a lawsuit on it. There was a uh, board members acting weirdly. So if you're curious, a little bit of oil patch history, look up the Lights, Lightstream Resources lawsuit and uh, you'll learn a little bit about the shady dealings um, that can happen um, as well. This is a super interesting and important clause in here. So the CEO and the CDO um, of Saturn had a deal where um, in a termination or change of control situation, AKA getting bought out, they would get 5% and 2% respectively of the company's market cap at the time. What does that do? Acquire. If you have that sort of clause, you want to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You don't care. You just screw the shareholders. We just get bigger and bigger because our lump sum payment is so massive. That now got changed. With this Ridgeback deal, it no longer made sense. So it got changed to a 5 million and a 2 million uh, performance warrant kind of uh, compensation. And those compensations are still really good making tens of millions of millions of dollars each on it. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing. The point I want to get from this is when you change a compensation structure of management, similar to what's happened in the Permian, 
you get them acting differently. So even though Saturn continues to want to grow, the growth will maybe be funded with more of a different style, which could be to the benefit of shareholders, given that these shares that uh, the CEO and the CDO are getting are based on vesting at certain share prices, which means they now are, are incentivized and aligned to increase the share price. This was missed by lots of people. And Saturn is now a maybe very similar company to it was six months ago, 12 months ago, but the management incentive has changed. Whether you think it means anything or not, very subjective. Um, as, as somebody looking in, it definitely makes this a lot easier company to invest in now that this, uh, now that this has changed um, in the company. It's, it's not a material change, but it's enough of a change to know that there's been a, a shift in the way the company will operate. Uh, some of their cardium land and also some of their cardium wells. So pretty good, 180 barrel per day cardiums. Um, not that much for inventory once again, but they just keep the production as is. Keep drilling on the outskirts, three, four wells a year. There you go, production's flat. So they don't need that much inventory. Um, maybe, maybe seven, 10 wells a year since the cardium is a little bit bigger. Uh, part of their asset. Uh, K-Bob Montney, same thing. Four wells per year maintains production. Uh, Swan Hills, they have uh, maybe one or two wells per day uh, can maintain that production. So um, quite good. And the way that you can run some calculations on your decline rate sensitivity is take your BOEs per day. Look at how much CapEx it, it costs to maintain production on that field. So they're saying four wells. So it's going to cost $16 million to keep 2,300 BOEs flat. And 2,300 BOE per day flat, 16 million. You're paying roughly $7,000 a year per BOE to keep it flat. What, what money are you making on that BOE in that year? If you're making $50 a, a day on that BOE, you can be making $18,000 a year uh, from that BOE in one year. 365 days times 50. So it, it's costing you seven, you're making 18. You can run very rough uh, break-even analysis on this. You can run very rough a uh, decline rate analysis. You can really figure out a lot of things um, just by doing um, these, these, these basic sort of things. Um, if the company will give you that information on that specific pool. Uh, Saturn also telegraphed they're no longer in growth mode and plan to switch to shareholder return mode. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people are saying we'll see it when we believe it. But uh, yeah, there's definitely been a change. Take that from me because I was an absolute critic of Saturn Oil and the way they rolled up these companies uh, at the benefit of the shareholder, uh, at the expense of the shareholder over the last little bit. Um, and then you can also gain a lot of information from half cycle economics. So if you, if the company is willing to give you half cycle economics, they will tell you, okay, what the payout is. Uh, this is May 2nd, 2022 strip. Keep in mind, we're talking $100, $90 to $100 strip, a lot higher. But this is all I had from the Ridgeback presentation. And this is what we see here. The K-Bob Montney, where they have about maybe 20, 30, 40 locations, at a $95 strip, it's a three-month payout. Less than three-month payout. What does it tell you about what Saturn can do if oil prices rise and they stay there? They now have the inventory to go and increase production in an area where they only need four wells per year to maintain production. They, they, they have that optionality. Again, I've been saying this a lot here, but don't underestimate the impact of higher prices and how the economics change on, on, a, on a higher cost acreage. You could have very high operating cost you could have very high capital cost, but because the wells come on so strong, the difference between drilling them at $75 oil and $95 oil is the difference between a 80% IRR and a 500% IRR. It's, it can be that drastic. Uh, and certain companies are just sitting on this inventory waiting, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. When it comes, well, bam, you go and drill a six, eight, 10 well batch drilling, you bring on 5,000 uh, barrels per day, or, or BOEs per day right away, 
and that all pays out in three months, the rest now is gravy. And it's not that expensive, 2.9 million DCET. We're not talking seven, eight, $10 million Montney wells. This is the KBOB Montney, uh, which is relatively shallow. It's like the Anti Creek Montney, uh, very shallow, lighter oil, doesn't need as aggressive of fracks, higher permeability, relatively decent. Uh, okay, uh, I think this is the second last one, maybe the third last one. So IPCO Core 4, they bought Core 4 for $62 million. Uh, US, $84 million Canadian, uh, about 4,000 barrels per day for only 84 million. All oil, cheap, a lot of uh, ARO that comes with it, uh, asset environment obligations. They said they're gonna drill six wells in 2023. We'll see how the results are. But the first two Ellerslie wells, or, or the first three are looking quite good. Lots of BOPD here. Um, and quite a fair bit of inventory as well uh, on these lands. So here, um, they, they also were selling some assets in 2020. And the comment made was, IPCO operated wells immediately south of core four. Two and a half years later, IPCO bought out not just the non-core sales, they bought out the entire thing. So gives you some idea. Adjacent operators are always makes a lot of sense for the synergy uh, in buying these things. And then I saw this comment on Twitter, um, nothing against the person. I'm just going to read it out. Uh, IMO outside of the multilateral potential. It's a bottom tier asset. Produce a lot of water, high OPEX, bunch of ARO, and mostly freehold. So royalty rates suck. Fair enough. Now let's look at it a different way. You bought 4,000 barrels per day for 80 million. 20,000 a flowing barrel. It's at least half as cheap half the valuation as any other asset that has transacted in the last three years. It's maybe a third the price, given that this is basically 100% oil uh, that's being produced here. On top of that, this Ellerslie oil play that is being mentioned as a outside of the multilateral potential is just thrown in there as a, as a oh, could be, could not be. Well, we, we, we already have wells that are showing exceptional drill results, 550, 600 barrels per day and sustaining for 18 months. We got a second well here, making 350 barrels has declined, but still making over hundred barrels per day, relatively cheap drills. This is the overall asset that um, a Cardinal has delineated. So Cardinal was the one that first found this asset. You can see they're up to 2,500 B, uh, BOPD. Here's Cardinal's well came on at 650 barrels of oil per day. This is a major opportunity. It's not, it's not just outside of this, it's a junk asset. This is part of the asset. Um, so definitely um, an interesting trilateral uh, uh, open hole. I don't know if they're open hole, but it's, but it's definitely trilateral um, drills that are being done here. And we'll see how they pan out over time, but, but there's a lot of land here. Um, that they can still drill using this technique. And this all came from Rock Creek Freak. So uh, kudos to him for doing a bit of deeper research on this. Already, he talks about the the way that the asset was put together. And then the red wells are the wells drilled by Core 4. We can see some really, really poor wells, but we also see the good wells. What makes them different? The fact that Core 4 had no money. So they tried a couple of things, didn't work. Then they hit a banger, and then as soon as they hit the banger, they had to sell. So now we'll see what IPCO can do uh, with this going forward. Uh, to do Woodland Vermilion just closed here. Uh, this is a Southeast Sask asset, 5,500 BOEs for 225 million. We're back to that 40,000 flowing barrel. Uh, Woodland is a private company. Uh, they didn't even reveal that they bought the asset, so I kind of found out later. Uh, decent wells, Southeast Sask. We got our Mydels, we got our Alidas, we got our Tilston beds, and we got a couple of Frobishers here and there. And they make 80 barrels, then they decline, then they stay there for a long time. Some of them can be water flooded, some can be CO2 flooded, some just decline like a conventional well. And um, the kind of the cool thing on, on this asset is uh, in this asset included is this small, Alida North Alida pool. And the Alida North Alida pool is of special importance to me 
uh, because when I did my uh, capstone project in petroleum engineering the last year, uh, our, our project was on the Alida, North Alida pool. And the project essentially consisted of going and figuring out how are we going to increase production from this pool? So we talk about infill drilling, we talk about water flooding, uh, we talk about reservoir management with, with some sort of changes in injection. Um, we, we discussed uh, polymer flooding, we discussed all, all sorts of things, uh, multi hundred page uh, project put together. And uh, it has now come full circle in a sense. Uh, the reason for it being that the production on this asset, uh, there was a couple of drills on this asset in late 2022. So uh, the last drills on it were in 2017. Then it kind of started declining. We can see here with the number of wells active. Uh, then some of the wells got brought back. Um, and then in 2022, we finally had a new drill in this Alida, North Alida pool. And uh, yeah, doesn't really mean anything because uh, it's 50 barrels, 50, 60 barrels. Um, but at the same time, I, I love the uh, coincidences of life where things come full circle after five years or six years. And you see a uh, familiar name pop up. We can also see the water injection has gone up here. Uh, but it was just an asset that was too old for Vermilion. They didn't want to deal with this. They had seven or eight workover rigs going. Uh, they want to play in the big boys leagues. So we'll let them play in the big boys leagues and we'll get Woodland out here um, to um, uh, go in and uh, produce this. And uh, yeah, I, I was trying to find a copy of my capstone project, uh, but the University of Alberta deleted everything on Google Drive. Uh, as of like three months ago on, on all university accounts. So unfortunately, I think it got lost, but uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to try and find it again um, so that in my one of my future presentations, um, I want to talk about some of the courses that we took uh, in, in, in the program, some of the different kinds of projects we did and uh, different presentations and what we learned. Uh, because I do think it's, it's, it's important uh, to share as some of my viewers might be Fingers crossed. Looking at that um, as a as a potential career choice, um, if they don't believe that oil is dead, which uh, I think uh, the majority of people believe that, but at the same time, the opportunity is there for those that don't. And uh, as as part of my initiatives, um, I do think I I want to share the benefits of uh, doing and and having an education program that centers around uh, oil and gas and especially the engineering aspects um, of it. And we got our last one, Spartan Crescent Point. We've talked about this in detail, but $1.7 billion and uh, 600 new mounting locations, 38 KB OEPD, 20 years of reserves. Here's a nice little map um, of it. Shows you the assets that were bought um, along with the existing CPG assets. And then all this went to Logan, this other stuff outside the circle. And $1.7 billion, I, I don't think is a fair price. Um, I think the Gold Creek and Carr um, and some of the Southern assets are worth a lot more, um, including Puscoupe actually is drilling some 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 nice oil wells. Um, the reason I believe this was sold at the valuation it was is you got to go back into the history of Spartan Delta. In uh, 2020, 2019, uh, Spartan Delta came from, a, from an entity called Return Energy and Return Energy raised $25 million at one cent. And uh, this was later a hundred to one share consolidation. So they, they raised money at a dollar. And with the dollar, um, a lot of the money was raised at a unit. So the unit also gave the holder a warrant. The warrant was again at a dollar uh, strike price for five years. Therefore, if you bought one of these units, you were able to buy two shares basically for dollar each. And you got a $9.60 dividend with this transaction occurring, plus the shares of Logan being able to be spun out with a part of the management team that wanted to continue in oil. Some of the management team retired. And that's essentially why I believe this transaction was made is they said, you know what, this is a good way. We can 9, 9.6x our money, take it out. 9.6x the warrant, take it out. And then we also get to keep the shares in Logan as part of this, and we can let Spartan Delta continue um, as 
as their existing shareholdings. So they made roughly uh, something like 16 to 20 X in three years on $25 million of management capital um, that went in. I, I would also exit and say, you know what, just sell it, just sell the asset. And if, if we can get 20% less, it's all right. Just sell it. We'll, we'll, we'll cash out. We'll move on. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. This is, this is what uh, incentivizes management to work towards producing value for the company. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, the return energy shares could have been bought for as low as two cents. So after the 100 to 1 consolidation at $2 for anybody that was paying attention that the Spartan team uh, had made a comeback. So even those individuals made 10x um, since that time. Um, and they are out there riding into the sunset, uh, just like many of the oil investors from 2020 um, are now. So with that, um, hopefully gave everybody a few things to think about a few different transactions and the way valuations and metrics and multiples have changed over the years. And I uh, think we'll look look forward for the next big deal, but uh, sounds like most of the recent deals have been uh, multi-billion dollar deals. So we're going to see uh, possibly M&A in the major side of things, uh, as opposed to the tiny little deals that were happening uh, 2020, 2021 um, and, and uh, onwards. So with that, I think I'll wrap it up. Um, not going to do a Q&A today. Uh, pretty exhausted. So, um, yeah, yeah. The K Bob Montney, um, definitely. There's gonna be more, more, more uh, parent-child interference. But right now, there's just too much open acreage. So for now, it's okay. As as time goes on, yes. Um, and then, yeah, I I didn't talk about any U.S. deals or or any international deals. This this strictly covered Canadian deals. Um, I don't find the U.S. deals that interesting. They are always overpriced. You'll, you'll hear me say bad things about deals, about the companies. Um, people know I don't support the Permian or Eagleford acquisitions at all. So essentially you're asking me to badmouth companies <laughs> back to back to back. Uh, and uh, I don't need to get there. So there, there's definitely some other deals too, like Tanaz made those in, in Europe and uh, Africa Oil made some in, uh, in, in the Nigeria and all this, like cool deals. I just don't have enough insight to offer um, on those. So uh, maybe in the future, yeah, I, you know, probably what I will do is is do some sort of, um, like it's not going to be its own session, but I'll throw some of the shale deals in there as sort of a post analysis, maybe a year down the road. Once they've drilled a few wells on that, on that uh, acreage, we can go in and figure out, okay, um, how are the wells are drilling? Are they any better? Uh, have they made their money back on this? What what's what's going on? How's the inventory look like? It's just too early. The the shale deals are notoriously hard to make conclusions on right away. Um, Montney, Duvernay, Permian, Eagleford, uh, even the Bakken, the, the Williston Bakken, very tough. Whereas conventional oil, you, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on um, right off the bat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened to the shares, the Russian shares of Spartan Delta. Um, I know some of it got seized. Um, I think it just got canceled, to be honest. I, I don't think it got split. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did sell MEG. I mentioned that at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, it was used to strictly fund the Prairie Provident equity raise. That's it. I needed money from somewhere, and uh, I didn't want to pull money out uh, from margin, nor did I want to inject new cash into it. So essentially got sold for strictly that reason um, with Prairie Provident now making up a pretty similar position of the portfolio. Um, at, at this point in time, the the reason it makes up less of the portfolio is because Meg was on margin. So when I sold one unit of Meg, I only got half of that in cash back. So essentially that's why Prairie Provident is not my biggest holding, but all that money was used one for one um, to get into the Prairie Provident um, uh, uh, equity raise, I should say. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you bet. No, always appreciate everybody's support and your patience. Uh, it's been about a month since I did the last one and I'm definitely trying to lower the, the, uh, amount of times I'm doing this, but have the presentations be more impactful and hopefully one that people can watch and then keep learning more from the slides or just from the commentary, a uh, bit of a longer presentations as well. And, uh, yeah, I think next week, 
I don't entirely know what I'm going to present next week. So I will see. And then I'm going to take the July 30th off and uh, kind of go from there. So that's how I'm going to run it for now. Um, and we will go from there. So thank you, everybody, once again. And uh, we will catch you at the next one. And, uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday here. Cheers.